Nazis have discovered Tannis. Just what does that mean to you, uh, Tannis? Well, well the city of Tannis is one of the possible resting places of the Lost Ark. The Lost Ark? Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant, the chest the Hebrews used to carry around the Ten Commandments. What do you what mean, do you mean the... Commandments? You're talking about the Ten Commandments? Yes, the actual Ten Commandments, the original stone tablets that Moses brought down out of Mount Harab and smashed, if you believe in that sort of thing. Any of you guys ever go to Sunday school? Once again, Bucketheads, Mavar Tigar. Welcome to a special bonus episode of MandoVision. We're interrupting our regularly scheduled Star Wars programming for a very special treat. My name is Tom, Nargai Tom, and thank you so much for checking out our normally small independent Star Wars podcast. <laughs> Remember to reach out to us via social media at Mando underscore Vision on Twitter and Instagram. You can email the show at MandoVision. Tom, excuse me, my goodness, MandoVisionTom at gmail.com. Make sure to like, subscribe, follow, and share the show with all the Mandalorians in your covert. Well, as you probably saw on the, the, the header on this episode when it came up in your in your podcast or feed, yeah, we're doing something a little different, and I'll be perfectly honest with you guys. Um, I don't think I ever thought I was going to do this. <laughs> I, I, I had a lot of uh, a debate about putting content on my Star Wars show that was not specifically Star Wars related. Uh, but but a, a lot of back and forth, and I think just sort of like the sheer fact that at the time, at the time, I don't think there was, I, I don't think I ever had a thought of, of there being a, a, a fifth Indiana Jones movie. I don't think I thought it was going to be a reality. Like The rumors have been going around for years, but it, it, it sounded like it was never going to get off the ground. Spielberg was kind of like not interested, and how invested was Harrison Ford really in the idea? Uh, but but I, I've been proven wrong. It, 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 Dial of Destiny will be in theaters uh, uh, June 30th. And odds are I will be in the theaters somewhere around that date as well to check it out because I can't get enough Indiana Jones in my life. Uh, it is probably the, the my, my favorite film franchise other than Star Wars. Uh, I, I love these films, even... even the, the previous entry, that which, you know, maybe wasn't the best, but it was still Indiana Jones, so I was in. Uh, so, so, yeah, we're going to talk. I mean, and again, there's some crossover appeal here, right? Harrison Ford, Han Solo himself, his next big franchise after Star Wars is Indiana Jones. And I think a lot of you in this listening audience, uh, from a, 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 we're in the same age bracket at the very least, so I, I would like to think that Indiana Jones is... is probably hopefully as impactful to you as it is to me so that is one reason why we're doing this so that's why we're taking a little bit of a break between our, our the, the the final episodes of of star wars the clone wars for season five you know we're doing that really pivotal ahsoka arc and i didn't want to interrupt that in the middle to do these so we're gonna have two bonus shows based around indiana jones coming out for the next two weeks we got today we have raiders of the lost ark which I'm very excited to talk to you all about. Well, I'll, asterisk. I'll put, I'll put an asterisk by that. And then next week we'll release Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which uh, I'm, I'm ecstatic to talk to you guys about. So uh, I want to apologize in case you hear a little background noise. Uh, one of my neighbors is having a stump removed right now, and it's very, very annoying. But I, you know, I only have a small window to record this intro for the show. This episode you're about to listen to for Raiders of the Lost Ark 
was actually recorded in 2021 uh, for another podcast I was doing at the time, the TomCast podcast. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Regardless, uh, it, to me, in my opinion, it's one of, the, one of the finest episodes I've ever gotten to do for a podcast. It's one of my favorite podcast episodes I've ever done. And so uh, I, I saved the conversation. Uh, we're re-recording. I'm re-recording intros and outros for everything. But the conversation is still the same. And my feelings on Raiders of the Lost Ark have not changed. So I feel like it's still a valid conversation. And again, it's only from 2021. Uh, it was to celebrate the Raiders of the Lost Ark's 40th anniversary. So again, a very valid conversation. And I think you will still really, really enjoy it as much as I enjoy listening to it. So if you've heard it before, uh, check it out again just to kind of refresh your memory on things and maybe get you a little bit more fired up for Dollar Destiny than maybe you are already. And then next week, Temple of Doom, all new conversation. Uh, and it's... I think it's a I think it's a fairly illuminating conversation. Like we re we really dive deep into into sort of the the, the character arc that Indy goes on uh, in that movie. That that is a prequel that is set before Raiders, and you know we'll, we'll talk a lot about it in that episode. But there's a reason why they said it when they did. But what what they do with the character is also very very interesting too, and where he starts to where he ends in that film. Good stuff. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the, this show. We're linking up with my brother Mark from 2021. So strap on your buckets. Let's go. Marion's the least of your worries right now, believe me, Indy. What do you mean? Well, I mean that for nearly 3,000 years, man has been searching for the lost ark. Not something to be taken lightly. No one knows its secrets. It's like nothing you've ever gone after before. <laughs> oh, Marcus! What are you trying to do, scare me? You sound like my mother. We've known each other for a long time. I don't believe in magic, a lot of superstitious hocus pocus. I'm going after a find of incredible historical significance. You're talking about the boogeyman. Besides, you know what a cautious fellow I am. All right, let's welcome in our special guest for the day, my brother Mark, all the way from the Los Angeles. How are you doing today, sir? I'm good, sir. How are you? Are you are you ready to go on a globe trotting adventure to track down the lost ark, to plunge the depths of the well of souls and all that good stuff? Yes. <laughs> are you ready to lash yourself to the periscope of a submarine? No. No, that's gone. We're, we've gone too far. You're just gonna go home with Katanga and call it a day. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, how yeah. are things going? You, you doing well? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this show. Uh, you know, we, we kind of talked a little bit uh, in the prelims before we turned the recorder on. Um, you know, I'm excited. We, we, we are doing this. It is the 40th anniversary of Raiders of the Lost Ark this year. Can you freaking believe that? It's hard to believe. It's really hard to believe. The movie debuted June 12th, 1981. And here we are in, in 2021. And, and uh, you know, I, again, I, not to get too far ahead of us, but this movie plays to this day. It is so good. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll control you, your enthusiasm there, buddy. To take it down a notch. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> All right. Well, what are you drinking today? What's in your What's in your glass? As we As we do on the show, we have a tradition. It is to uh, have a beverage while we're recording the show. And what do you got today? Uh, I'm drinking Ecliptic Brewing's Meridian Vanilla Stout. Ooh, very nice. It's interesting. Okay. All right. It's It's not. There doesn't. I'm not getting much vanilla off of it. It tastes more like just like an oatmeal or a coffee stout. Okay, okay. Well, I'm having uh, from our good friends at Pizza Port Brewing Company. You know, I don't. They didn't. I, I don't have access to an Indiana Jones beer, but what I do have access to is Pizza Port's latest can release, Han Shot First Double IPA. So I feel like I'm in the right wheelhouse. Harrison Ford tribute beer right here. Harrison Ford shooting guns. Yeah, he's got his little blaster and he's, he's shooting Greedo. They're in the shadows. It's not blatantly copyright infringement or anything like that, or trademark, inf whatever infringements, right? And it's super cool. And this is this is a rad double IPA, eight point three percent. And again, from our good friends at Pizza Port, Han shot first double IPA. It's awesome. <laughs> and I'm gonna set that down now. All right, Mark, I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up to you right now. Um, what to you? What like like what is your impression of Raiders of the Lost Ark? Like what is its uh 
cultural impact on you? Cultural impact? <laughs> How has it impacted you in your life? Let's put it that way. I mean, like, what does it mean to you? I mean, look, I just think it's it's a fun action adventure movie that takes place during the real world history of, of World War II. Um, and I think it might have been my first introduction to the idea that um, Hitler was interested in the occult. Mm -hmm. And so it just makes it a very interesting time period mm -hmm. in which to set your film. And I like how it how it plays off of those ideas and, and expands on that. Um, and, you know, I, I think... I think the great thing about it is that Indiana Jones is, he's just a man. You know, he doesn't have any superpowers. He's got plenty of limitations. Um, and he has to, he has to outsmart and, and outwork his, his enemies. He's quite relentless, which I, which I really enjoy, you know? Right. Yeah. Th this movie, I mean, you know, we grew up together and we watched these movies quite a, quite a, bit together i would say right once once, once we had, got our hands on the vhs's we, we would play these a lot you know particularly the mm -hmm. first two and then eventually last crusade once that came out in 89 um, right i feel like indiana jones was on quite a bit in our house growing up uh and it, it's become one of those movies to me where you know again maybe it's because i am also in my 40s much like this movie now is but i i can't get enough of this i just watch it whenever it's on i am totally absorbed with it every time I just go for the for the adventure for the ride. It's it's still just the the perfect balance of action, adventure, fun, intrigue, mystery, supernatural elements into it. I mean, it's it's kind of got a little bit of everything in it, and it's just this wonderful, beautiful harmony of stuff. Right. And and we should we should say we should give credit to where credits due. I mean, Harrison Ford obviously is the guy who brings this role to, uh, brings this role to life, and mm -hmm. and I guess I'm wondering if if you would say. That, that this role is even more iconic. I mean, this is the iconic role for him, right? Like, like Han Solo is a big deal, but like this, this is Harrison Ford, right? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I go, I think it was, it was a few years ago now. I remember there being talk about rebooting Indiana Jones and, and, and recasting it with, with Chris Pratt. Yeah, that was a big reboot and, for a while. Yeah, and you know, I remember thinking at the time, like, yeah, I, I mean, I guess if you're gonna choose anybody to do it, that that's that's not a bad choice, but it's still just, you know, Indiana Jones, he's not like a James Bond where you can just uh, get a new actor to play him every every few years. It's so much of the character's personality and charm is caught up in Harrison Ford. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Harrison and what he kind of brings to it as, as well as the rest of the cast, but we should get the rest of the, of the particulars kind of out of the way. So Raiders of the Lost Ark debuted June 12th, 1981, directed by Steven Spielberg, who was a, was a fairly big deal at that point, right? Yeah. I mean, this was, you know, it was post Jaws. Yeah. Post Jaws. However, you know, he was a known name. We got a story by George Lucas and Philip Kaufman, two excellent screenwriters. Obviously Lucas coming off of Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. Right. And, and a screenplay by Lawrence Kasdan, who was uh, no slouch himself either. Right. And uh, our, our basic our, our plot description here is, in 1936, archaeologist and adventurer Indiana Jones is hired by the U.S. government to find the Ark of the Covenant before Adolf Hitler's Nazis can attain its awesome powers. And our I, 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 lo I love this cast so much. We got Harrison Ford as Indy, Karen Allen as Marion, Paul Freeman as Balosh, or Balak, depending on how you want to say it. Right. <laughs> Uh, your boy Ron Lacey is 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 Major Tote, who you love. I know you do. You like him. When is that the Nazi. stereotypical German general guy? Super Nazi, yeah. Okay, yeah. I it, it's funny. I've I've the, seen the SS this movie. guy. What's that? The SS guy. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Oh, the guy in the the leather trench coat. Yes. Oh no, I was thinking of the guy. We don't see him until they get to the desert. Yes. Okay. I know. I know which guy you're talking about. Yeah, um, but it's funny. I mean, even the guy in in, in the trench coat. It's like I just. I've seen this movie, I don't know how many times, and I still cannot remember their names. <laughs> we got John Reese davies as Sala, Denholm Elliott as Brody, and a very young Dr. Octopus, a.k.a. Alfred Molina, as Satipo in the very of beginning course. of this movie. Yeah, you can't, it, it, it's funny, it's like you can't not mention him 
in it anymore. It's such a small role, but no, but I mean, like what we spent like what probably twenty years watching this movie before, like, is that Alfred Molina? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think you were the one who first pointed it out to me after. <laughs> you know, 20 plus years had gone by and uh, Spider-Man 2 came out. Right. Well, and I'm trying, I'm trying to think like, like, you know, obviously Alfred Molina has a, has a wonderful film career, uh, you know, behind him and, and, and ahead of him hopefully as well. But I, I don't remember when I started noticing Alfred Molina as Alfred Molina. And then like, cause there was definitely a, a point where I knew who Alfred Molina was as an actor, <laughs> right. but I never connected him to this guy in the beginning of Indiana Jones who tries to steal the idol. <laughs> like I never got there for a while. And I said, like, wait, that's the same, that's the same fucking guy. I don't, I don't think a lot of people did. <laughs> it's just so wild to see him so young at the same time. It's just, it's, it's fun to watch that. And, and, you know, be like that guy's gonna be a real big actor soon. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's a pretty darn cool thing. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I love this cast. I love this movie. Everything about it's so much fun to me. John Reese Davies as Sala is is so to me perfectly cast. Even though apparently, according to Steven Spielberg, he wanted Danny DeVito to be that part. Thank goodness that did not happen. Right? How wild would that have been? <laughs> I think I think that would have been terrible. Yeah, I don't I don't know how that would have worked honestly. Uh, but but that must be how DeVito ended up in Romancing the Stone. Uh, it was it was due to his, his his contract. He was on taxi at the time, and he couldn't get out of out of that to or, or okay. they, they they wouldn't let him out to do that to do the movie. He was, you know, under that contract. Um, you know, uh, actor, actors' contracts are much more flexible nowadays than they used to be. Right. Which is which is ultimately how we got Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones to begin with, anyways, because because exactly. uh, Thomas Selleck was was, was going to be Indiana Jones, uh, but he was doing Magnum. Right. He's doing a little tiny show called Magnum. Was there um, I because I was thinking about this the other day, and I don't. Was there ever any test footage of Selleck? Ooh, that's a really good question. I I, I kind of want to think there is, right? Like, I mean, he must have come in for the part at some point. I mean, they offered it to him, right? And then yeah, it was like, like I, CBS I, I was feel like, like no, there no. is, but I haven't seen it. I want to say there might be. I, I it may be on. Oh God! I, I wish you would ask me this before we started recording because now I want to go look at the special features on some of my my uh, DVDs and see if there's anything on there. Because I, I I feel like that does exist though. And I mean, if you want to, if you want, I mean, if you want to see Tom Selleck as Indiana Jones, there is an episode of Magnum that is basically uh, he can't be Indiana Jones in the movies, but we're gonna let him be Indiana Jones in this one episode of Magnum, <laughs> where he gets to go on a, on an adventure in Hawaii with a with a hat and a leather jacket feel like i've seen that episode and maybe that's even what i'm thinking of possibly yeah let me see i'm googling it right now oh okay um <laughs> you know it's it's my podcast <laughs> do what i want <laughs> uh, oh yeah no apparently there is test footage okay all right here i'm i'm queuing it up on on the youtube right I tested now tested a lot of book indiana joneses oh uh, this Tim is from Matheson. this is from like the documentary uh that you can watch on um, on, I think DVD. it's on, on one of the special features on the DVD and yeah, it's, it shows, it shows Selleck doing it. Yeah. Doing like a screen test. Okay. That's cool. Very, very interesting stuff, but obviously they didn't even have the look of, I think that's Karen Allen that he's reading against as well. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to play the whole scene for everybody <laughs> to listen to. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no, wait, actually, apparently it's Sean Young in this, in this test footage. Oh wow! Okay, I didn't hadn't heard about that. Yeah, but I mean, they hadn't even really solidified his look because it's just like kind of a, a very basic fedora and a very basic brown leather jacket. They didn't really do like that 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 a kind of that kind of like aging on the costume that that kind of like sort of lended to the authenticity of of him being this globe trotting adventurer who's had many many adventures, and this is just one of them. Right. Which again, I think is part of the charm of the movie is like you just kind of like it. it it is kind of like Bond in a way, where you just kind of like jump into the middle of one of his adventures, um, and I think that's such a cool way to handle things. I mean, obviously the movie's inspired by the those old Alan Quartermain serials and a little bit of the Tarzan stuff from from when Spielberg and Lucas were kids, um, mm -hmm. but it, but it did kind of hit on on the, that that Bond. Let's jump into an adventure, and then we'll get to the then we'll get to our our movie after our hero escapes from whatever danger he's in right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was that was the thing, right? Like, um, prior to this, I think Spielberg was being considered to direct whatever the next Bond movie was at the time. 
and uh, Lucas came to him and, and said he had a different idea, but was was kind of similar or something along those lines. Actually, I, I, if, if I may, and I could be wrong, so, so, so bear with me, but I always thought the rumor was Spielberg lobbied to be the next Bond director, but because he's not British, they were never going to let him do it. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. I mean, that could be right. That's it's, yeah. it's an old story I heard a long time ago. So that that that's what, the way I remember. It, but uh, but I, I'm willing to uh, acquiesce if 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 I, if I am wrong. But yeah, the, the Bond has to my to my recollection, Bond has this this like that's kind of like the the tradition is that it's always directed by a citizen of the United Kingdom. Is that is that true to this day? I believe so. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> by all means. <laughs> and you know i mean i i like i said i could be wrong i don't i do not want to uh i'm not gonna uh dig my heels in on that one but at least in recent history that is how bond movies have been uh decided directorially okay you know maybe maybe not at the very beginning but i i, I kind of think that's been the way it is we'll have to get some bond experts on to <laughs> come and comment on that <laughs> <laughs> I do not I, as much as I enjoy James Bond I do not consider myself an expert right <laughs> speaking of, since we are speaking of Spielberg though uh, and, and you being um, uh, uh, the guy with the cinematic eye uh, what do you think of, of of the way he shoots this movie could be uh, there, there's so much that he does in this movie I think I, that that's just translates so well to the screen Again, so many iconic moments, iconic shots. But 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 what what's your take as an artur of the cinema? I mean, I think it's great. I, I think it's very good, and I you know I I think there's a reason why the movie endures to this day, and it it's still a fun, enjoyable action adventure movie. Um, there were a few things watching it, like I I think the the gunfight in. Uh, Marion's bar yeah uh could have been covered a, a little bit better um but you know <laughs> that that's me you know but but then you get to kind of the uh indy indy we have no time if you still want the ark it has been loaded onto a truck for cairo truck what truck the end of the second act of the film and you get that big chase scene in the desert where Indy's trying to get the Ark back from the Nazis. Um, and that's a, that's a fantastic chase slash action scene. So, you know, Oh, for sure. I, the, the truck scene's incredible. I, I, to this day, you know, it, it's, it's so fun to watch and, and yeah, I, I can't get, I, again, I can't get enough of this movie to begin with and it's 40 years old. Um, it, but it's, it's, so much fun to watch this fucking movie. Let, let let me go back to to the beginning of the movie because I do want to talk about the opening and and the way it, it kind of you know we get the Paramount logo and it kind of fades into that mountain, which I, I don't know mm-hmm. why I always I always thought that was so cool. I still do. Oh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> I, I think I think it's great when when studios let um, the artists kind of play around with the logo and and do things like that. It's always fun. Mm-hmm. And and so we we're, we are transported to quote unquote South America, which is really Hawaii, but for this purposes, it's South America. Um, yeah, I love the way that we're, we're going through the jungle. We don't really know what we're doing. We're just following this group of characters, we, and we don't see Indy from the front yet. It's like ten minutes until we see Indy turn around, and it's when uh, when the, when the guy's trying to steal the map from him that you know when he turns around, and cracks the whip. And right. that's when we finally see Harrison Ford. Uh, something about that kind of like slow reveal of of him as the hero, as as like our our protagonist. I, I again, I just it's just another touch. I think it's so well done and so well executed. Like you spend ten minutes, like what's going on here? Yeah, um, you know, it builds a little bit of tension and um, and creates mystery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you get a great introduction to the character, especially when you know, especially when you get the whip, and you're like, "What the hell? This guy's got a whip!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's pretty badass. <laughs> Let's go into the temple. All right, Alfred Molina as as Sepito, and 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 uh, and and Harrison Ford is, is Indy, obviously. <laughs> right. I wanted to. <laughs> I can't help but laugh about it, thinking about it now. But <laughs> you got this scene. And, 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 you know, like, Indy's got, like, you know, four, 
five tarantulas tra- on his back. <laughs> and he brushes them off very casually. And then Alfred Molina turns around. <laughs> and he has so many spiders on him. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Terrifying. I don't like spiders. So that scene, to this day, gives me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, it gives you the creeps. <laughs> what do you think of the booby traps in the, in the temple? Oh, I love them. It's, um, you know, it, it's just part of the fun of, of Indiana Jones. It's, it's, it's kind of, that's what it's all about. I mean, at, at this point, you're like, I want to be an archaeologist. This sounds like fun. <laughs> well, yeah, that was something I, I, I was going to say. Is like, this is the movie every kid watches, and, and, you know, they want to be an archaeologist, and then they go to school, and they realize archaeology is, you know, just sitting in an office reading books. And <laughs> they're like, mm, not so much. Not so much, yeah. By and Indy found all the all the cool treasure about that. You know, by the time we were kids, so yeah, there was nothing left oh, to find. All the good stuff's been found. Well, and I mean, whether you consider this archaeology or not, you know, I see those trailers for that, uh, you know, the Curse of Oak Island shit on the History Channel, and apparently, all you do is just get like a bulldozer and like some cranes and you just dig and try to find shit. <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't know if you can comment on that. Maybe. I mean, yeah, if you have a house, you can just go out to your backyard and start digging and call yourself an archaeologist. <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, I see the commercials for that, that Oak Island show, and I'm like, they're not really preserving the dig site very well, are they? They're just ripping the ground open. They don't really give a shit. They're trying to find treasure. They're mostly treasure hunters. They're probably not really archaeologists. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's a big, big difference there. Um. It's also at this point now. Again, as we as we're chasing through the jungle, we're getting a, a, a hint of of what is to come from the the masterful John Williams score. Um, mm. But it's it's to me it, it sort of really kind of I don't want to say culminates, but you 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 really get to kind of feel what the music's going to be in that sequence where Indy is kind of weighing the sand and judging the te- the the weight of the of the idol. As he's gonna, yeah. as he's gonna make the switch on there, and it's just kind of like coming to this this wonderful crescendo, crescendo, mm-hmm. I should say. And yeah. <laughs> talk to me about about John Williams' score. I mean, like this man scored basically our youth, our childhood. Yeah. But how impactful is this soundtrack to you? I mean, it's fantastic. It it you know you get all the action adventure elements that you would want out of sort of the the indie march, you know. But then the rest of it it does such a good job of building tension, but also creating uh, that sort of mystery, the mystery around these artifacts that, that Indy is hunting and, and touching on the, the supernatural Mm -hmm. aspects of, of, of the story. Like what probably my favorite piece of music from the movie is the music that they play whenever they're talking about the arc or or whenever you see the arc it, it's such like a it's such a haunting piece of music it, it's really perfect the whole score is perfect but yeah it, it really is and I, I think it's one of the reasons why i, I constantly like i said if, if i'm flipping channels and i come across like paramount network and, and raiders is on or any of the indie films really is on uh, i instantly get sucked in and the music is such a key component of, of transporting me into the movie and 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 just convincing me that all this is like super legit it all happened this is a documentary and i'm living it right now like <laughs> the, the score is it's, it is pitch perfect like you said it, it, it touches on all those all the different elements of the movie whether it's the romance with the indian and marian themes right. or it's again like you, you get a little, the, the kind of haunting supernatural tones when they talk about the arc and then obviously the raiders march is just iconic and how do you not hum that to yourself when you're just walking down the street i don't know or is it just me? <laughs> is it just me that does that? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's not just you. I guess I do that every now and then. <laughs> I mean, whenever you, whenever I walk the dogs, I th- I sing that to myself because it's like we're going on an adventure. Let's go, do 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 do, and the dogs go crazy. So they're like your Marion and Sala. <laughs> well, I don't want to diminish Marion and Sala, but you know, to <laughs> to an extent. Well, I mean, one is a one is a boy dog and one is a girl dog, so. <laughs> The genders are appropriate. There you go. <laughs> okay, the, uh, before we before we transition out of the jungle, uh, I, I got to ask you about the boulder. I mean, come on, <laughs> the boulder's so cool still. 
Oh, yeah. And I mean, just, you know, it's one of those things that, like the movie itself, that that image, it's it's just endured for for a reason. You know, it's, it's just classic. Yeah. I mean, so many so many sequences in this movie are just like seared in, into my brain. Uh, you know, the obviously the boulder chase, you know, Indy running from the boulder. Uh, the when he arrives at at the uh, at uh, Marion's bar in Tibet and in, in, uh, in Nepal. And mm-hmm. and you know and they use the silhouette against the wall as they as they open their conversation, and then the shadow, yeah, yeah. The the use of shadow in this movie, I think Spielberg is on fire with it, and, and the way he silhouettes them when they're doing the dig, I mean, it's so good. Yeah, yeah. That stuff is just top notch, in my opinion. Like Spielberg just hung hung up his hat after this, and be like, I'm done. Fuck it. No, he shouldn't have done that. But again, it's just yeah. great. It's, it's so good. I you know watch again. Uh, this is again. I watched this. I've, I. This might be the only movie I've seen maybe as many times as Star Wars, possibly more at this point, because I just, again, I just throw it on whenever. It's beautifully okay. shot. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I think I think Douglas Slocum as the uh, the director of photography uh, definitely deserves a uh, a shout out because the, the movie looks great. Yeah, it really, it really, really does. Um, yeah, I love the boulder sequence. I, I love the introduction of, of Belloc. When when he takes the idol because he has the Javitos. he knows how to speak Javito. Right. I I love that whole sequence so much. Uh, we, we you know we, we mentioned Paul Freeman as as Belloc. He's so good as Belloc. Like he's he's the bad guy obviously. And he's working with the Nazis. That's not cool. But he's kind of got like this interesting bad guy charm about him that I really enjoy watching this flick. Yeah no he's uh, he's great in the role and. It's interesting because you know I don't know if I've seen him in anything else, but but he's so good in this, and he is he he's quite charming, and he's likable, um, even even though he's he's working with the Nazis, you know he's a uh, he's he's just a mercenary, and you know that that's something about that's something else about this movie that I think is really interesting. It, you know Lucas and Spielberg kind of created this whole. The, this this world of competition amongst archaeologists that they're <laughs> they're kind of stabbing each other in it's the very, back. It's very cutthroat. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty pretty interesting. Uh, and you have definitely seen Paul Freeman in something because he was in Hot Fuzz as uh, Reverend Philip Shooter. So go it's back been and watch. So Hot long Fuzz. since I've seen Hot Fuzz, I don't remember that character. But okay. Yeah, Hot Fuzz, so good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great movie. We'll have to do a uh, the you know, the movies of Edgar Wright at some point on the on the podcast, and we can do Hot Fuzz. <laughs> but we have Neto trilogy. Oh my god! Well, we did do Shaun of the Dead last year with with Ryan from uh, from Come On It's Still Oh, that's good. right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, Hot Fuzz is is the next in the in the, in the trilogy. Yeah. Yeah, but I I, I don't like I said like. I like Belloc so much as the bad guy. I mean, g- granted, I want him to die at the end when he dies <laughs> because of his his hubris towards the uh, towards the the whole situation, towards the arc, towards everything. Uh, you know, assuming it's this power, this 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 radio for talking to God, as he says to Indy at one point in the movie. Uh, right. You know, so obviously, obviously that that sort of thing not going to play well with the religious folk. Uh, so well, he he has yeah, what's I mean, coming. Just that, and the fact that. Yeah, he's perfectly fine with the Nazis having this. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I mean, again, <laughs> again, he's a he's a French archaeologist. They have they have they. I don't think in, I don't I can't remember if in 1936 they were occupying France or not, or if that was. On I the don't cusp. think so. Poland was in 36. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah, that's that's another thing I meant to Google before I started this podcast and I forgot. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I don't think they had invaded France just yet, but it was on the cusp. Well, no, I was just looking it up. I, I oh, think it was nineteen. Okay. I think it was nineteen thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. Okay. Well, there you that, go. That they invaded France. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So that that does make a little bit of sense because you you would imagine maybe Belloc wouldn't be as cooperative uh, with the Nazis uh, after they had invaded France. Probably took took away his family winery and all that good stuff. Right. Well, <laughs> like I said, like you said, or actually, like you said, I like this whole archaeologist versus archaeologist. Uh, thing they have going on in this movie. I think it's a really fun aspect. It makes the, it makes this profession seem really exciting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, just that and the fact that, you know, your main character is carrying around a whip and a gun, mm-hmm. you know, and he just, he kind of, he just kills people with impunity. 
So. Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, most of them are bad. They're trying to kill him. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm not saying that. But, you know, even when people are bad, there's usually some kind of consequence for it. Well, not in 1936, man. Nope. <laughs> the, nope. The world, the world is your oyster. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there is, there are, yeah, there is a very, well, I mean, let's, let's say, like, Cairo's pretty heavily Nazi occupied at that point. So, you know, there may not have been a lot of local law enforcement going on in Cairo. And for those sequences, right? Uh, I couldn't say what was going on uh, when they're in Nepal. Though, I mean, Nepal's remote enough; it probably would have taken a while for some kind of constable to get out there. Yeah, I mean, you know, it it just looked like a small little. I don't even want to say it was a town. It literally just looked like a tavern on a mountain. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> I think that's exactly what it was. It's like a little outpost on the side of a mountain in like Kathmandu or wherever, you know. Yeah, if that's if that's Marion's only source of income and her plan to get back to the United States, she's she's going to be there for a while. <laughs> uh, one of the and you know again, I'm not really planning on on doing like a chronological walkthrough of the movie. Sure, but 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 you know, kind of before I wrap up, what I have to say about the the opening sequence the jungle sequence um when you know when belloc holds up the idol and and the havitos are, are are kneeling at it and indy makes his escape and the the, the dash to the through the through the jungle to get out to uh to the to the to the ship to the plane the river you know the mm-hmm. water plane um again another iconic sequence uh but that's where you set up i again i think very masterfully the snake situation, India's oh, yeah. situation with snakes. When the uh, when the pilot of the of the plane, his pet snake Reggie, is in in the front with Indy, and Indy, we find out Indy hates snakes. Right. Again, something I, I wonder I, to me, just wonderful foreshadowing of things to come. And they establish this early on. It's not something that's thrown in later on. And we're like, oh, by the way, I don't like snakes. Right. No, they 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 set it up and and they pay it off. And and that's that's something else uh, about the movie is that I mean it's a, it's a very tight screenplay. There's mm-hmm. very little fat on it and and it it really it really just moves from it's, one beat to the next. It does. It it was funny when I when I queued up the the movie to watch it. Um and you know and you, you see the runtime's like I think it's like an hour and 55 and you're like, yeah. "Man, this movie goes fast. <laughs> like that is a really quick two hours. It goes fast. And, you know, I think the thing is, is just like with the, with the state of movies today, it just like two hours just does not seem like a lot of time. It, it doesn't, but I mean, we're, we're, you know, things aren't slow in this movie for very long. It's a lot of great action stuff, but I, I think the thing that I, I distinguished from this movie, uh, compared to like a lot of today's action adventure flicks, um, you know, we we sort of talked about it a little bit with with sort of like how, like, I don't want to say down to earth or or you know like practical, you know the action sequences are, but it's definitely by comparison to the stuff these days, like there's not like that that kind of like spectacle, right? You know, it's not like who can do the bigger, better explosion, car flying through outer space kind of thing. You know, yeah, like it's just. I don't know. It's, it's, again, for lack of a better word, it's just kind of grounded and real the way the action plays out. Well, honestly, like, um, you know, I was watching it, and when I was a kid, I remember this movie felt so big and so epic to me. But yeah, by today's standards, I was watching this, and I just thought, well, this is quaint. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah, and I don't like I don't mean that in a bad way. I I just think that that's that's just the progression of 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 cinema, you know? Because I like I couldn't help but wonder like if some like if if a kid who grew up on like Marvel movies and stuff who's maybe 10 or 12 years old uh 10, 10 or 12 years old watches this, like are they going to feel about Raiders of the Lost Ark? the way I did when I was that age and I watched like the 10 commandments or something like that, where it's just like, Oh, how boring is this? <laughs> you know, I, I, it was just a thought, you know, I certainly hope not. I think this is much more entertaining than the 10 commandments, you know, but, but yeah, I, I do wonder about that. 
Oh yeah, I, I think I think at our our ages, it, it it's always um, an interesting exercise to kind of theorize what younger audiences w- would feel about the things that we hold so near and dear to our hearts, as far as like the like a great cinema going experience. Right. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I feel like we're we're not o- we're not too old that we can't enjoy both. You know, like the the new Marvel stuff or like some crazy Fast and the Furious stuff or whatever, uh, and still appreciate right. you know indie and Star Wars and and you know Jaws and the, and those kind of things. Yeah, no, hundred percent. You know, I mean, or like not... the old, even even like the old Bond movies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which again, if, if you want to describe a movie that feels quaint, like what, when's the last time you watched Goldfinger? My God. <laughs> Doctor, no. Right, yeah, exactly. I mean, like those are great movies, and I love watching them. But you know, by by today's standards, I mean, just comparing it within the Bond franchise, you're like, wow, right? <laughs> like the stakes seem so much smaller in these older ones. Yeah, but, no, we've but definitely thing, come a long way. But that's kind of the thing about Raiders. Like, I feel like the stakes still hold. Is like, like this is a big thing. Like, I mean, to me, the Nazis are still bad guys forever and ever and ever. You know, I know some people maybe don't hold to that anymore because you know Nazis are still around now. Like, who would have thought? But I'm not even going to go there. Yeah, we, 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 we should not current, uh, comment on the current political climate of this country. But, I, again, I, I feel like the stakes hold. It's like, yeah, the Nazis should not have the lost Ark of the Covenant. That sounds like a really bad idea. Wait, yeah, 100%. <laughs> we can't let Hitler get all these cool like uh, occult items we want him in our museums, damn it. Yeah, no, and, you know, I, I and, and, as, as far as quaint goes, you know, like, I'm not even talking about the stakes. I mean, very clearly in this, in Raiders, you know, the, the fate of the world is, is what's at stake. You know, the same thing can be said of, you know, Dr. No or Goldfinger or whatever. It, it's it, the the sort of quaintness of it just comes in sort of, you know, the way it's shot. The level of, of action and the, those yeah. things. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no I got gotcha. you. I, I, I might have started going off on another tangent. Apologies. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> I want to talk. About, uh, I want to talk to you about the the, the university sequence. Okay. Uh, you know, we we come back from Indy's adventures in South America, and we we find out he's a professor at a university, apparently highly respected. Uh, is is a bit of a um, he's the teacher that all the the female students want. Apparently, they're all, all into the him. All the ladies love. Yeah, he's got a, a very uh, female dominated class. Because, uh, you know, it's Harrison Ford. Why not, right? Yeah. I want, again, this is pure speculation, but do you think Indiana Jones is a good teacher? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's teaching the class. He gets a little bit distracted. But he, he powers through his lesson, and the bell rings, and he's still, he's still giving instructions. And he clarifies to them when he'll be in his office for further clarification on assignments and that sort of thing. Yes, I think Indiana Jones is probably a great teacher. Except he goes on Globetrotting Adventures, and then you get a fill-in professor for the next like three weeks of your semester. <laughs> well, I mean, fair enough. But you're getting a teacher with real-world experience and one that will that will prepare you for the cutthroat world of archaeology. Yeah, but if, if, if Indy is the cool professor, and then he has to have like the strict, you know... Uh, uh, you know, iron fisted kind of professor be the, be the fill in, the substitute, the guy covering his classes. Man, mm-hmm. you don't you you don't want to sign up for that class. <laughs> like, what are you, what's going on there? Or or and, you know, is the archaeology department so small that Indy's the only professor, and then your classes are just canceled for two weeks, and then the semester's ruined? I feel like he he probably has Marcus step in. Yeah. Well, I mean, Marcus is running the museum. I don't. Is, I guess he's part of the university too. So yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, I feel like he's part of the university. That makes sense. That makes sense. That was that was one of the parts of the. Listen, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole uh, and talk about the Crystal Skull movie, but that was one of the aspects that I liked. Is that what movie is that? The Crystal Skull. I've never heard of this. Okay, fair enough. But of this alleged <laughs> movie that it does exist. I did like that he sort of like leaned into the professor thing and he kind of was becoming more like his dad. You know, I did like that kind of development for the character. Sure. <laughs> okay, fine. What I wanted to really talk about, though, uh, in this sequence at the university, uh, when he goes to meet with military intelligence. Yes. You know, there are a lot of movies out there, you know, hundreds of thousands of movies at this point in, in, in our lives that handle exposition so clumsily. Mm-hmm. This, to me, might be one of the best scenes of exposition ever. 
Like the way I it agree. fills in the audience and those characters who have no idea what's going on. Yeah. I love I, it. I love this sequence. It cracks me up. It's awesome. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's also when we... Um, I, I think it gets a big help from John Williams because it, it's when we get introduced to that I, I don't know what the music is actually called, but it's kind of like the theme for for the Lost Ark. Right, right, and right. It, it's when we get introduced to that, and and so it adds that that mystery and and that tension and kind of sense of foreboding of what it is that Indy is going to be chasing after. Mm-hmm. I, I I love the sequence. We're uh, we're actually going to open this episode uh, with with a cut from that sequence where he's talking about what the Lost Ark is, and, and he ends it with, like, any of you guys ever go to Sunday school? Because that fucking cracks me right. up. It's so funny to me. <laughs> right. Yeah, and one thing I, 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 I did notice during it was, you know, Indy had kind of a lot of a lot of details that, you know, you wouldn't learn in Sunday school as far as the, um, the staff and what's the medallion called? I think it's just the med- medallion, right? Or, like, the... I thought I thought he called it the Eye of something. Oh, the Eye of Ra was it? Was it the Eye of Ra? I don't. Either way, because you need the you need the sun to make it work, so Ra makes sense, right? Yeah. So I don't have that. Um, I didn't write that part down. I apologize. No, that's okay. So, so and, and I was wondering though, like, are we supposed to think that he got that information from Abner, Marion's father? Like, is that why he he knows that? I think so, yeah, because obviously they were, okay. they were looking for. I, I believe military intelligence was initially looking for Abner Ravenwood, um, yes. but obviously he is uh, unfindable at this point. We don't we don't. That's that's kind of like the one question I wondered about this movie is like, what exactly happens to Abner Ravenwood? Is he killed by the Nazis, or is there some other thing that happens like, leading up to the events of the film? I w- I did become a little curious about that that thread which they don't talk about very much, but I, I was interested in it. Yeah, I mean, there's just the line Marion has that, that he died. Right. Um, yeah, but but yeah, we don't get any information beyond that. I always I always assumed that it was the Nazis who, who killed him. Yeah, I mean, he's mentioned in that communique that, that the military intelligence people are reading to Indy and Brody. Uh, right. So that was always kind of my, my assumption too. But I've always kind of wondered, does like, you know, whether it was like a novel or a comic book or whatever, I've always felt like there was like a little tiny, I don't want to say prequel, but, you know, like a little adventures of Abner Ravenwood before he dies that helped set up the events of these of this movie. Because obviously the Nazis have been going full bore after the after the arc, even while Indy's off doing stuff in South America. You know, like this is, you know, Indy's kind of jumping into another thing that's already kind of going on. So it, yeah. it, would, it would have been a little interesting to explore that and if Marion knows more than kind of what she's shared in the, in the movie right. of like, you know, the, the Nazi interest or, or you know, things of that nature. I don't know. It's just something I was curious about. Uh, but yeah, it seems like they, they come to Indy because they can't find Ravenwood, but they know that through whatever information they have access to that, that Indy was sort of like his protege. And so yeah. he's the next guy on the, on the ladder to talk to you about this communique that mentions Tannis and the well of souls and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't think it mentions the well of souls. I think it just mentions Tannis, but yeah. But yeah, yeah, I think it, yeah, it just said Tannis. Yeah, I just I, I wanted to mention the sequence because like they're, they're, like I said, there's so many movies that handle exposition so clumsily, and to me, this is one of like the best ways to you fill in your audience while you're teaching these characters who don't who don't know what's going on. I, it, it it it's again, it's sort of like a masterclass in 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 screenwriting from Kasdan and Kaufman and, and Lucas, which yeah, is, is not surprising I, because those three is like a murderer's row of screenwriters. Right. And, you know, I think it also, you know, like I was saying just about the, the script in general, that you, there's not much there's not much fat. They they just kind of get to the point of it. Mm-hmm. it. It doesn't waste any time. So, you know, even though it's a scene of exposition, you're you're in it for maybe three to five minutes and, and then you're out. Yeah. And it, it's rather it, it's delivered rather entertainingly. So and, and uh, yeah, it gets you caught up and you know what's going on. And you're like, OK, here's the stakes. Here's what's up. We're going to get some Nazis. we got to get this arc thing. And, and it was so funny because I remember, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I had no idea what a fucking arc was. I was like, what's an arc? <laughs> I thought it was like a boat. And then it was like this. It was not a boat. <laughs> it was you know, right. like a chest, basically. <laughs> but a really cool, yes. a really cool one with a, with fancy sand in it. 
Fan- fancy sand. Fancy sand that shoots uh, laser beams out of it. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for supporting me on my my fancy sand and laser beams argument. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's how it's described in the Bible. Yeah, <laughs> you're not wrong, sir. You're not well. Uh, I guess it depends on what edition of the Bible you have. Yep. <laughs> All right, so that's when we get indie. Uh, he gets the approval. He's getting funded. The the museum's going to get the ark. You know, all these promises are made. Money, and and the museum, and fortune and glory. All these things, right? Okay, yeah. Fortune and Glory is in the next movie, but whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So we get Indy. Again, we're trotting the globe. We're going we're going to Nepal, and that's where we get the bar sequence. And we've, we've kind of already talked about that scene yeah. uh, where kind of all the forces kind of come together. You, you got Indy on one side, you know, Marion in the middle there with the, with the medallion, with, the, with, with, with what they desire to help them achieve their goals. And then obviously the Nazis show up. Uh, Major Tot, Tot shows up. Yeah. And is menacing from the get-go. Uh, yeah. Let's let's talk real quick though, because this seems like the appropriate time to talk about Marion's character, and 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 how she is not she's very much you know, I guess to evoke another Lucas character. I mean she's she's very Princess Leia ish in the, in the sense that she's very capable and is not like the damsel in distress is not like the screaming Mimi character. You know, like she is uh, very hands on and and is not gonna have terms dictated to her and i love that about her no she's a great character and i just want to point out like great introduction to her character with the, the, drinking uh, the game. very iconic drinking game 100 percent. yeah uh, i still love that scene i love the look on the guy's face when he passes <laughs> out he's so happy to be passing out <laughs> he just like slides off the bar stool <laughs> it's so good yeah yeah it's classic did it remind um, you of any moments in your life no, <laughs> because I would have walked away from that table long before. <laughs> they had a lot of alcohol. They honestly. had a lot of whatever it was they were drinking. Oh, and Marion, like, not only is, like, is she, like, she's, like, playing that dude. She's, like, playing yeah, that dude. Yeah, she's totally fine. Yeah. She's, like, I got this. This guy's a sucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love it. You're right. A hundred percent. A great introduction to that character. And the way she spouts off with Indy, the way she rebuffs him, you know, you think like, they're like oh, they're just going to go like all happily together, blah, blah, blah. But they have this history. And again, you know, we're jumping into the middle of an Indy adventure. Uh, mm-hmm. So you have like these things that we don't understand fully because we weren't there for them. But like Marianne and Indiana Jones have a history. It seems borderline inappropriate. I don't know how I felt about that necessarily. Uh, and you know, as, as I've gotten older, I don't know how I feel about that <laughs> in context. But I'm like, well, whatever. It's you know, the 30s. It was a different time. I wasn't there for it. Well, you know, I mean, it's also, you know, there is the line that that Indy says. You know, he's like, you knew what you were doing, right? So... But she says she was also a girl, and I was like, ooh, that's a little alarming. But I, in my that, mind, that, in my mind, she's 19. In term, my mind, though. she's at least 19. She's just young. She's just nineteen, and he's maybe in his early to mid twenties, right? Is that does that I mean, safer? well, no. I mean, look, that's definitely more of the way I'm thinking. I'm thinking she's in her early twenties or something, and you know, he's a little later on, maybe, obviously. Yeah, perhaps, but, perhaps. Like we're we're not saying he's yeah. a statutory rapist. That is definitely not what we are trying to say. I just no. worry that the way people take things nowadays, you know. Well, okay, I'm not even going to go into that. That's fine. <laughs> but they have a history and they have a they, they have, have a history they have a history and the, and I again that's uh, to me that's another neat element of the movie it's it's like uh, again I'll, I'll evoke another Lucas uh, classic I'll, you know Star Wars you know Star Wars is cool because like it's like you're in the middle of something you're like oh like they're talking about things that happened that you don't know about you're like oh like, we're just in the in, in we're just in this story and that's how you are in Raiders like you're just in their story and I, I think that's a really great way to bring these characters around again, you know? It's just, I don't know. It's just, it just really, really works. It translates so well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's what, you know, Lucas talks about when, when he talks about Star Wars. He talks about how it's a it's a lived-in universe. Yes. And you're being dropped into the middle of it. And he does, they, they do the same, the same thing with this. And so it adds, it adds a sense of, of realism to it. Yes. You know, I definitely remember Lucas talking about that in, in regards to Star Wars and how he wanted 
you know, the ships and everything to kind of look, you know, like dirty and lived in and used. And, right. And that's kind of the world that India is in as well, too. Is it, you know, it's, it's lived in. Like, people have had lives. Like, we're not just going on someone's first, you know, adventures or whatever. Like, like no, India's been doing this for a long time. He talks about it. Yeah. No, it's great. It's, it's, uh, I, I like what, I like the Marion character so much. And uh, I, apparently Karen Allen had uh, quite a bit to contribute, too, because uh, apparently on set, there were a lot of a lot of rewrites, you know, occurring as things were developing, and the story was kind of evolving and changing and whatnot. And uh, they allowed her to kind of shape, help shape the Marion character, so that she was proactive and not just kind of like running away from danger and you know running towards Indy or something like that. You know, like she was you know able to be uh, her own protector. You know, she has the pan, the guy with the knife and the pan and the whole thing. And, right. You know, like I, I, I again the elements that I think make her such an endearing and, and uh, charming character. Right. So yeah, I love Karen Allen. This, uh, you know, Karen, yeah, she's great. She doesn't have a she, Karen Allen doesn't have a, an, a, an overwhelmingly amazing like you know film history, but like she's been in some of my favorite movies besides you know with this and then like Scrooged, which is one of my Christmas favorites. Yeah, those are the first two that come to mind. I feel like there's something else. There, there, like there, there's more in the middle, but uh, they're more. Uh, uh, I would want to say like a, like dramas than 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 they are sort of like the like the kind of movies that are in you and I's wheelhouse. Sure, sure. So then after the fire, you know, Tote burns his hand on the medallion. He tries to grab the medallion, which is a cool sequence. I really like that. They obviously ripped that off for Home Alone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like they're like, hey, Joe Pesci, we're gonna do this thing that we saw in Raiders of the Lost Ark with the doorknob. Get ready. Yeah. <laughs> Except Joe Pesci's, uh, you know, they don't use his to find the, go into the the map room. Sounds like no. a mistake. Sounds like a huge mistake. All no, right. did 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 that? I don't remember if that comes back in any way during Home Alone. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. Yeah, um, uh, I actually do want to say though, but before, like, right right as we get to the um, the Marion introduction, you know, we also see that very classic iconic um uh the, the map, map graphic the map. that shows yep. indie globe trotting from place to place and it's such a i think it, it it's like such a great way to uh sort of you know kind of like fast forward the exposition and show them going from one point to another and it, it's it's just very iconic for the series yeah yeah you're right and and we should mention too that uh, as indie boards the plane uh Tot is on the plane as well, and you right. get like the the again the, that those sinister notes from the that John Williams score come into play, and you're like, yeah. oh, who's this guy? And then you know he shows obviously he shows up at Marion's bar to get the to get the the, the medallion, and yeah, good stuff there. I, again, more foreshadowing that comes into play again. Like you said, the script is really lean and really tight, and it's it just it just works in so many ways. And I know I know you had some some uh, critiques of of the shootout in the bar, but I really like that sequence. I love the way the sound is is done in this movie as well, like like the gunshots and the punches. It's all just like it just sounds like it has this kind of like visceral quality to it that I completely respect and and love every time I watch it. Yeah, you know about the gunfight in the bar. You know, like any criticism I have of it is is very small overall. I think it's a very enjoyable sequence. But yeah, you're right. It, 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 the the sound in it is great, and one of the things that they do is they actually they they drop out the score, so there's no music and there's just sound effects, and and it, it it's a very um, kind of interesting and and sort of real. It gives the scene a little more, I think, gravitas and and, and realism to it. Yeah, and I mean not that, not that indie is the first one to do this by any means, but. You know, each gun has a distinct sound, and it, it just sort of resonates through when you're listening to it, you know? Uh, you know, yeah. I think, Indy, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he has like a 45 or something. Yes. And, it, you know, it has a very powerful sound to it compared to, like, the machine gun sound. And, again, just another, another element of the movie that kind of just helps combine to make it such an enjoyable uh, film-going experience, you know? The, 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 besides just, like, the, the story and the acting and the directing and the, and the music, like, the, it sounds really good. Yeah. It just lends itself to to make it even a more enjoyable experience. Uh, so we get to Cairo, and yep. uh, this is where the movie really takes off. Yeah, we're introduced to Sala, his family. Uh, you know, again, another another character uh, who is from Indy's past. They have an association, and we're just we're just kind of in here, and they're like, "Oh, that's Indy's friend," and now we're we're part of it, and it's all good. Um, yeah. 
we there's a monkey. <laughs> there's a monkey. There, who, there's a monkey, there's who a does, monkey who does the the the, the you know the the, the Hail Hitler signs and these other these other Nazis are sig hailing to a to a monkey. It's kind of funny. <laughs> we, right. <laughs> we, haven't really, we haven't really talked about the humor in the movie, but like there's a good balance of humor in there as well too. Like every time it gets a little serious, there's a little levity provided as well. Yeah, it's one of the great things about uh, about about uh, about the movie um, is that. You know, kind of like what we were saying, like it, it has these very big stakes, kind of the, the fate of the world. Um, and you're dealing with very scary subject matter in, in terms of uh, the, the supernatural. Um, but, you know, ultimately it, you know, there, there's like you said, there, there's a lot of humor, a lot of humor in it to, to, to help the audience through. Yeah. Now apparently this this is not actually filmed in Cairo. Uh, it, it was Tunisia because I guess like Lucas had you know money to spend in Tunisia apparently still from Star Wars days, so they used uh, they used yeah. Tunisia as sort of like the Cairo double. Um, but uh, the market sequence, you know, they're Marion and Indy walking around the market, and then the assassination attempts. Yeah. The action sequence that breaks out, again, super super fun, really enjoyable. Uh, you know, again, Marion with the pan and the guy with the knife and the whole thing. It, it's it's great. It's wonderful. It's so good. And then Indy. And the, and the guy who wants to challenge him to the sword fight, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it gets I me mean, every time. It, it gets me every yeah, time. Yeah. It, it's great. And, um, you know, it's one of those things. It's just like what what even can, can be said about it. So much has been said about it. But it, it's... It's just one of the most kind of iconic indie moments. Yeah, you know, he, he pulls the gun and shoots the guy and just turns around. He's like, I got shit to do. But, you know, yeah. I, and obviously now I think we all kind of know the story that, that Harrison Ford had had like dysentery the entire time he was in, in North Africa. And, right. Like, he was just not going to be capable of doing the complicated whip fight sequence that they had planned out for this. Yeah. And and I, I feel like he came up with the perfect resolution, and Spielberg was like, "Yeah, let's do it," and it works so well. And it's again another injection of levity in in a very uh, action packed uh, kind of you know serious sequence. It's an injection of levity, and it also you know it um, if they had done the whip slash sword fight. You always would have had that question of, well, why doesn't he just pull the gun out and shoot him? <laughs> it's a good you know? point, Mark. It's a good point. That's what that's what we bring you on this podcast. <laughs> okay. You have to be the other side of the coin. <laughs> no, it's it's a great point. You know, to this point, you know, other than the bar fight, you know, Indy has a gun, but he hasn't really used it for anything. You know, these, these guys are trying to kill him, but he hasn't, you know, just started mowing down people <laughs> with his with his forty five. Not yet. <laughs> this is when this is also when Marion gets abducted. She's in the basket. The monkey rats are out. They take right. the basket, uh, and then you get like sort of like the. Uh, it's a little complicated, but the basket switch, and the truck that that Indy thinks is on that she's on, exploding. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. If if they if they show it, I didn't catch it. On this last viewing, but do they show at any point the baskets being switched? They don't. The only okay. the thing I, th- I think I've decided over the years, you know, the more and more I watch it, is that Indy's just following the wrong thing. You know, like right. the, the, the Nazis have a distraction. They're like, okay, you guys take this basket and run over there, and th- and that's who he ends up following. Right. Yeah. No. No. I, I was just curious because. In the more you know, I was thinking about it, it's like, well, they probably don't want you. They don't want the audience to know that there was a basket switch because otherwise, uh, Indy's mourning of Marion would, you know, the if the the audience would know, and so it, it wouldn't be as impactful. Agreed, you, agreed, a hundred percent. You, you you nailed it completely. We totally buy into Indy's mourning, his sense of loss, the sadness that he feels, and again that that wonderful, mournful John Williams score that's playing as he's sort of like drinking his pain away uh, at, at yeah. her death, uh, that, that he brought her into this, you know, obviously the guilt he feels at the same time. Right. And again, this leads to one of my, one of my favorite uh, sequences in the movie. Again, this is where Indy and the lock have their conversation in the bar in Cairo. And it's, I, again, I, 
I don't know what else to say about it other than it's just so fucking fun to watch these two just spar with each other verbally. You know, and, and like like you were saying about the dueling archaeologist aspect, how Belloc is kind of pointing out to Indy that were it not for, you know, a few different things, they'd be the same person. Uh, and, and what would it take for Indy to kind of fall away from the light? Right. And you, again, you get the great line where, you know, Indy's just like, now you're being nasty. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, other, again, you get other great bits of dialogue in this sequence, too, you know, about, like, you know, Belloc saying, like, the, the, what is the, the arc is a radio for talking to God and stuff like that. It's just, it's such a great sequence. I love it when you can get these kind of, it doesn't happen too often in movies, and sometimes it doesn't play as being, like, authentic. Right. But when you get your antagonist and your protagonist in a scene together, just, you know, just going back and forth with each other, it doesn't always work. This works it's so good it's so well done again he's, it's it was, it's almost like Belloc's trying to recruit him over to their side yeah it is a, it does seem a little bit like that um and you know like you said i it, it's a great scene and seeing those two play off off each other is is a lot of fun yeah i, I it's a scene i dig it's there's a lot of, there's so much there's so much good stuff in there, you know. <laughs> when when Indy's like probably you know, all, sorry. No, no, no. I was, I was. I'm probably gonna have to pause it here and, and insert the sound clip that I want. You know, where Indy says, "You want to talk to God? Let's go see him together. I've got nothing better to do." Uncle Indy, come back home now. Yeah, that's a good line. <laughs> um, but I was gonna say, it probably. It, 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 Probably one of the the first examples of uh, you know the villain saying I'm I'm just the shadow of you and that kind of, you know like I feel like we've seen that speech a lot in in movies but this is is one of probably one of the original iterations of that mm-hmm. of that speech yeah uh, and and one of the better yeah you know you're you're definitely right about that. Um, so uh, eventually Indy's going to make his way out of this bar, despite the fact that everyone seems to want to kill him. Uh, but he's, yeah. he's rescued by Sala's kids, basically. They head back yeah. to Sala's place. And, uh, you know, while, while they were in the marketplace, Sala was working on getting, getting this, this guy who's going to read the medallion and give them the information that they need on them on the medallion. Uh, this is where we find out that the Nazis had their own version of the medallion somehow, but it was only one-sided. Right. And we find out that the staff of Ra that they're building, uh, the Nazis is, is too long. And yes. and uh, this is where the, they try to poison again. More people trying to kill Indy. A lot of a lot of a lot of people trying to kill Indiana Jones at this point in the movie. And we get we get one of my favorite lines when Indy's gonna pop that date in his mouth. Once they realize they have the correct measurements for the staff of Ra, and they're gonna go into that map room and they're gonna find out where the well of souls is and ahead of the Nazis, and they got the they got the upper hand now. And he's gonna he's, and he tosses that date into his into his into the air, and and Sala sees the dead monkey, the dead Nazi monkey. And he catches the date in the air and says, Bad dates. And it's one of my favorite things ever. I don't know why. I love it so much. It's a, it's a great line. I, I mean, I, maybe the line itself isn't great, but the delivery by, uh, by John Reese davies is great. So. I, I say that line all the time, and maybe three people in my life know what I'm talking about. And one of those three people is not my wife. She has no idea what I'm talking about when I say that. <laughs> That uh, makes perfect sense. Janine, not very good at the movie quote game, just for the record. At least not these movies. <laughs> yeah. At least not movies that you like. <laughs> she might be really good at the Sex and the City quote game. I don't, you know, I don't know for sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the map room sequence? Love it. One of it's my so, favorite sequences. It's so cool. And again, another great scene where that John Williams score just like it, it reaches that crescendo as the yeah. light strikes the stone. And sends the beam down to where the well of souls is. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and and you know it's a fun uh, kind of uh, treasure hunt um, obstacle, I, I guess, where you know you have to, you know, you you put the staff in in 
where it needs to go and, and you wait for the sun to, to hit the, the medallion at the right time and it shows you where to go. It's very kind of like a, very Spielbergian, I guess, you know, in terms of, you know, you think about, you know, stuff like Goonies and, and, and whatnot. And well, or, it's a lot of fun. well, and, and even, you know, further down the road, like the, 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 the stuff that it's, it's uh, inspired, that's more recent, like like Tomb Raiders and, and uh, Uncharted games, and you know, spe- specifically in the video game industry, like Indiana Jones is a huge influence with like uh, these sort of like puzzles and, and, and riddles you got to kind of fi- figure out. Uh, you know, yeah. Indiana Jones is, is his the way he's pervaded pop culture is just, I mean, it's it's he kind of has his fingers everywhere, right? Like there's always yeah. like a little bit of an influence on these things, like and then you know and well, we'll, we'll national t- we'll, treasure. We'll, yeah, we'll we'll talk about like some sort of the some of those things like at the end after after we talk about the movie. Um, okay. But yeah, but yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. Like like so much again. And this movie is inspired by those oh, those old Alan Quartermain serials. But in Indy was sort of like the perfection of all of it, right? Yeah, I suppose so. And and the, that that max that that um, map room sequence is is I again so good. Now let me ask you about this because it's also it's right for this that that uh, Indy's walking he's making his way through that Nazi camp because he had to sneak in there so he's got the whole um, uh, uh, gear on you know to disguise himself to blend in mm-hmm. um, but this is where he finds out that Marion's still alive and he has to, but he has to he has to uh, leave her behind because he can't let the Nazis know that he knows right right what did you think of all that. Oh, it's a great scene. My my only thing is like, you know, he just kind of stumbles into that tent by chance. Well, but... he's he's trying to avoid a group of Nazis that are coming his way in case he's recognized right. as a non-Arab. Yeah, I I guess it's just one of those uh, yeah. kind of movie things, you know, where it's just uh, sort of serendipitous good fortune. Yeah, that uh, he just happens to to duck into the very same tent that that Marion is in. Um, but no, it, like, like it's a great scene, um, b- between the two of them and, and, you know, you see that, uh, you know, Indy starts to free her and then he has to kind of tie her back up. Right. And she's not stoked realizes, on that. Yeah, yeah. She's not stoked on that. Right. Uh, let me ask you a quick question. Am I allowed to say Arab? Is that a word that's okay still? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Okay, good. All right. Cool, 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 cool. All right. So this is when we get, uh, Sala gets his diggers. And they know where they're going. They're going off site. This is the dig they're doing is so that the Nazis are doing is so big and so complicated that that Indy's able to kind of like sneak these diggers in and do his own dig under their noses. Uh, does that bump up against you at all? Or are you kind of cool with the way it, it jives? It doesn't bump up against me at all because if you go back to the scene where we're first introduced to Sala, Sala is saying like he's been recruited to help in the dig, but his assistance there is so inconsequential yeah. because they've got so many people working at the same time. So I think it makes complete sense that that they're able to kind of go in and just start just start digging. It it is such a a a, a big a big dig. Agreed. And he uh, Sala also says in that same sequence how there's there's not one brain among them except for Belloc. And, exactly. And, and uh, yeah, so one of the uh, you know sometimes I talk to people and they're like, "How does he do that with the Nazis all there?" And like, well, like it's big, <laughs> like it's big, <laughs> like everyone's digging everywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It, it, it um, you know, just it, that's one of those things. You know, stuff gets lost in in the shuffle in in bureaucracy all the time, and you know, yeah. So and this is where this is where you get that that again that sort of iconic. Uh, sunset silhouette of of Indy yeah. pacing back and forth, putting the hat on. They're digging. You, you know, you have like the the oh I, oh I forget the name, but you know the the, the, the sort of chant that like the diggers have, um, the the kind of those that that kind of um, sets a tempo for digging. You know, just like the way the, way yeah. the oarsmen would have for uh, ships back in the day. Yeah, yeah, uh, very cool. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. What did you think of of Marion and Belloc getting drunk together? <laughs> I think it's great, and um, you know, it, it, again, it, it's one of those things. That they 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 set it up at the at the start of the film when they introduced Marion, that that she's playing him, but then you know we get the turn that you know it's actually him playing her, and and I like that. Yeah, I think it's a really a really neat sequence with the, with the two characters. Again, two two actors seemingly having a a, a good time. 
uh, because apparently they were allowed to sort of improv the whole thing. Like they weren't okay. quite sure how. The, uh, apparently Spielberg and 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 the, the and the writers were kind of like they didn't have like a, a concrete idea what they wanted that sequence to be. So mm-hmm. so uh, Karen Allen and Freeman got to kind of figure it out on their on their own and what they wanted it to be, and and that's what they settled on. And I, th- I think it just works so well. A- again, K- Karen Allen's input in this movie apparently c- cannot be ignored for her character, and then again for this sequence. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it, it's probably why it works because I, you know, I think scenes like that, it, it, it's kind of hard to write a scene like that because it is such, um, you know, what what you know, what are these two characters kind of talking about really? You know, they're they're just kind of getting drunk together, mm-hmm. and and so, you know, having the input from the actors on, on something like that, I think is always, um, very important to, to, to lend, uh, credibility to the scene. Yeah. Well, and, and I think you have to wonder too, when you're watching it is, is, you know, you're, you're kind of wondering like, Oh, is Marion going to get the jump on him or is she just going to kind of like get him drunk and let him pass out? Like, like we saw when we were introduced to her, is that kind of like her move here? Like what's, yeah. what's the play? And then, you know, tote shows up again with his, uh, n- nunchuck jacket holder. <laughs> jacket hanger <laughs> which yeah. is a great sequence uh which spielberg tried to use he, spielberg tried to use that that uh that gag in 1941 with belushi and Aykroyd, and it didn't play um it plays in this i don't know why it just works so much better for this yeah i mean i can't i've 1941 is one of the few spielberg films i haven't seen so i can't really say anything about it i've seen but, it like maybe but, twice. yeah it works here I've seen it twice, and I think I watched it the second time because it's like, oh, it couldn't possibly be as bad as I remembered, and it, it wasn't. It wasn't good. Yeah, I mean that's what I've heard. Every, everyone tells me just just stay away from it. It's not <laughs> even worth your time. Uh, so at this point, as this is going on, you get Indy and Sala. They're opening the well. They're, they're lifting that that huge concrete slab, uh, so that they they can go down into the well souls. And I'm not gonna lie, I, again, another gag that makes me laugh to this day. <laughs> when when they when they're trying to peer down into the well and then the the lightning flashes and Sala yeah. sees the statue and it scares him. <laughs> yeah, it makes me laugh so much, and I know it's coming, and I I just laugh anyways because it cracks me up. <laughs> yeah, it's great, and and John Rice Davies' uh, delivery of it is is great. He just you know he just owns it. Yeah, and then you get the next the next big thing, and this this pays off from what we set up earlier in the, in the movie. But Indy, why is the floor moving? Right. Why does the, I think he says why does the floor move, and then you, you, they toss the torch down and it's just covered in snakes. Yep. <laughs> oh, it's so good. And you're like, hey, wait, Indiana Jones, he hates snakes. Yep. But they got to go down there, so they go down there. And Ass. He, Very dangerous. You <laughs> go first. You go first. Exactly. <laughs> Again, so good. It's yeah. so good. <laughs> your delivery that was perfect mark i want to commend thank you, you. thank you thank yes, you that was beautiful oh i love it i love and i the, the fact you did that makes me love you even more okay <laughs> so they just they descend into the well of souls they're gonna get the ark and then and this is where we see it for the first time the the thing we've we, we we've been looking for the entire movie the ark of the covenant and right. uh it looks great <laughs> i'm not gonna lie if if someone offered me an Ark of a Covenant as a coffee table, I'd take him. I'd be like, yeah, I'll take that as a coffee table. Thanks. Looks really good. Yeah, it's it's such a cool design with the two. Uh, are they? Is it owls? Are they falcons? With, but with like the wings touching. Yeah. On, on the opposite ends of the of the Ark itself. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's such a cool design. I think they're falcons, but I could be mistaken. My my Egyptian mythology is not as good as it used to be. Right. <laughs> I forget which which uh, bird was more sacred to them. So, but it, yeah, it, 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 either way, it's a really cool, evocative image. I really dig it. You know, as they're as they're uh, as as Sal is on one side and Indy's on the other, and they're getting ready to lift up the ark out of the out of the uh, the sort of uh, crypt that it's in. Um, mm-hmm. and, and for any sharp-eyed viewers out there, and it's a lot easier to see now that like with with high def and 4K and and stuff like that. But uh, just off off of Indy's uh, like right arm. Uh, you can see as a hieroglyphic. You can see uh, R two D two and C three PO. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've always heard that. I don't think I've I've ever actually spotted it myself. I've never, um, I've never really looked for it, but I've heard it's there. It's definitely easier to see nowadays uh, in 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 the high def. 
That's for uh, sure. Well, I, I was watching it in glorious 480p DVD. Oh my! Look at you. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised you didn't just sit on the VHS. <laughs> I, I don't have a VCR. <laughs> And I don't think I have these in uh, in widescreen on on VHS. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. All right, so they get the ark. They're gonna they they box it up. They're hauling it up, and this is when after Marion's uh, failed escape attempt, uh, Balak is coming out of uh, coming out of his tent. He's talking to all the Nazi generals, and they're demanding results. They don't know. They don't understand why they haven't found the ark yet. And that is when the one the one brain amongst them notices a dig site where there shouldn't be a dig site, and that is when the Nazis right. swoop in take the Ark, throw Indy and Marion back down into the Well of Souls, um, and it's snake time. Yep. <laughs> like, you thought there were snakes the first time? There's a lot of snakes this time. Uh, talk to me about that. Like, how is, is that pretty iconic for you? How's it, how's that work for you? I, I mean, it's great. Um... I, I love the sequence where Marion jumps on his back and her legs are just kind of like all over the place. Yeah, she's just... Because <laughs> that would be me. I'm not gonna lie, that would be oh, me. Wow. <laughs> all right, legs all akimbo, just like get me out of the snake pit, please. I'm not taking you on any adventures. Um, <laughs> no, they probably shouldn't. <laughs> no, it, I mean it, it's a great scene. Um, you know, you get the kind of the little bit of the the ticking of of, of the clock as the uh, the torches burn down. Mm-hmm. Um, Kind of my one, if I, if I were going to have any criticism of, this, of the scene, it would be that the torches do burn out, but there's still plenty of light in there. <laughs> well, and right. I mean, I get it. We, the audience, needs to be able to see what's going on, but mm, I think they could have. Uh, I think they could have managed to uh, uh, with darkening the image still a, a little bit more. Yeah. But um, no, very fun scene with uh, you know, Indy finding the way out, seeing where the snakes are coming in at, and realizing that there there there's an opening in one of the walls, and you know he climbs the the statue of, of Anubis and knocks it over and smashes through the wall. And, and that's how they get out. And, you know, that, that's one of those things. It, it just talks to um, the character's ingenuity and, and his resourcefulness in, in, in getting out of a, getting out of a predicament. And the fact that, he, you know, he has to, he has to think his way through problems. He's not, he's not the superhero that can just like smash through walls and stuff like that. Yeah. No, I, I I agree. I also like that uh, in in that in, you know when he knocks the Anubis statue over, uh, and it crashes through that wall, and they have to go through that, that next adjoining, adjoining chamber. Uh, I like that. That's where we see like why it's called the Well of Souls and all yeah the bodies and and st- that are in there. You know, I I really like that little touch to it. Yeah, and, and yeah, I I don't I, again. It's a small thing, but I was like, that's why it's the Well of Souls. Here it is. Yeah, and it is very haunting. Like, I remember as a kid, I remember that being, like, quite a scary sequence, especially when you see the one corpse with, like, that massive python coming through its coming I, out of its yeah. mouth. Oh, my God, that traumatized me for a long time. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, that was very <laughs> scary as a kid. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it the the way it plays is so great because, you know, our, our heroes, you know, Marion and Indy think that uh, – Marion in particular in, in, this, in this scene – thinks that she's now out of danger because she's away from the snakes and they're going to get their way out of here. And she, and she grabs onto the thing and it's a, a, a dead body. And then they all just kind of like collapse in on her and you, yeah. know, you, you think you're safe. And then you find out, Nope, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Not that she's necessarily in danger from corpses, but still it, it, it's a very terrifying moment to be in. Right. Yeah. I would, I wouldn't want those dirty dead bodies on me. That's good. Well, you know, if they died of the creeping death, uh, that would you know you you might be worried about contagions. Does that last after all that time? I mean, a, a biblical plague could probably last for a while. I, I would imagine. I suppose so. I su- <laughs> all right. So at this point, Indy su- uh, su- suppositions that like, hey, they got the ark. They're gonna fly it out of here. Let's go to the airfield where that plane is. <laughs> yeah. I'd love the pa- the plane sequence. I just do. Oh, I, it's it's wonderful. Um, yeah, he's trying to I will sneaky. say the whole thing. Did, did that? Go ahead. Go I'm ahead. sorry. Go ahead. No, I was, I was going to ask. Did, does that plane look like it can fit the arc? 
It doesn't. Lo- it looks like a very flat plane. It sure does. I don't know if they're going to strap it onto the hood or not. I don't know what the plan was. Okay, all right. You know, but uh, but uh, you know, Indy's like, hey, it's a plane. They're going to put it on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, it, it turns into another great action sequence where they, he has to stop the plane. He's going to stop the pilot. All the the whole thing. He's on. The, I'm assuming he's going to take. He's like going to take the plane. Is kind of like his plan. Like, what do you think he's doing here? Yeah, I think so. I, th- I think I think his plan is to get up to the cockpit, knock the guy out, and uh, and and assume control of, of of the plane. And then the the big uh, German bodybuilder guy comes out <laughs> and decides to, like that looks like a fun guy to fight. <laughs> I'm gonna punch him in the face. And I love Harrison Ford slash Indy's reaction to this guy, where he's just kind of like he's like, all right, all right, all right, come on, <laughs> give me a yeah. minute, give me a minute. <laughs> No, this guy was great. Like, I love his reaction. I love him. First, step, he, he's like in a hut or whatever, and he just kind of steps out like he's just, you know, he's drinking his coffee or what, just minding his own business. And he's he seems so overjoyed that, oh, there's someone to fight. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so great. This guy is awesome. You no, know, it really is, and it's a fun fight. And again, like you said, I mean, it, it, this this sequence, just like a lot of the movie has that to this point already. I mean, it talks to Indy just being like a normal everyday guy. Like, you know, he takes a punch, but like he definitely feels it. You know, like when he when he first gets that punch to the to the jaw and just his knees buckle and he collapses. It's so yeah. good. It's like, oh, that would be me. All right, <laughs> this is yeah, why this exactly. is why I don't yeah, fist fight. It, it, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's great, and uh, yeah, he really he really gets beat to shit in this movie. No, he really does. And it's, it's you know, through, uh, uh, you know, at, at one point, uh, Marion had, had taken the, the, the wedges that were holding the plane's uh, wheels in place and knocked the, the pilot out. But because of that, right. it got the plane spinning. And yeah. so eventually, uh, Indy wins the fight by default as propeller blades go crashing into that guy's body and sends which, blood spraying everywhere. Yeah, which is awesome. Which is awesome. I agree. Still one of my favorite moments. It's really good. I mean, the way the way that that Indy like kind of like ducks and covers, and the guy's like, "What is he doing that for?" And then he turns around, and he's like, "Oh shit!" Yeah, <laughs> it's so good. And again, another great reaction from that from that from that actor playing that part. He's like, "Oh." Yeah, no, he was he was wonderful in that <laughs> role. And then so and the plane blows up because there's a whole gas tank thing, and then you know Marion's shooting uh, you know the Nazis that show up to to stop them. It's a great action sequence. It's really really good. There's a lot to it. I know we're, we're kind of going through it quickly but it's a, it's a great sequence yeah and then our yeah, heroes a lot of fun. our heroes eventually meet up with, with Sala and he, he he tells him what's really going it's like no 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 the Nazis they're putting on a truck and then you get Indy going what truck and then that leads into our big sequence that we've already talked about a little bit but the, yeah. tr- the truck sequence is just so good to this yeah. day it I, to me it just plays so well the constant back and forth you know is Indy going to get control of this truck is he going to throw out another, another windshield uh, you know he's on the front grill. The guy's gonna smash him into, into the into the car in front of him with with Belloc and the other uh, generals of the Nazis, and uh, it, mm-hmm. it's so good. I don't know what else to say about it. It's 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 like I don't know filmmaking one hundred and one. It's perfect. Yeah, and you know I think kind of going back a little bit, uh, leading up to it, you know when he meets with uh, Sala and Marion, we get. Was probably my favorite line from the movie, which is, uh, you know, Saul asking him what he's going to do, and he says, "I don't know. I'm making this up as I go." <laughs> that's good. Too, I feel yeah. like that. That's just like such. That very much encapsulates who Indiana Jones is, and yeah, you know, he just gets on on horseback, and and you get this this amazing chasing uh, through the dev- de- through the desert with uh, you know killing lots of Nazis. And throwing them off of cliffs into <laughs> beautiful matte paintings. Oh, that matte painting is gorgeous. I'm not gonna lie; it's super. Yeah, good. I love it. I, you know, I we talked about it when when you and I did uh, Caravan for Courage. But I love me a good matte painting, man. Like that is, a, I kind of miss those. You know, <laughs> uh, I definitely miss them. I I think they add so much um, so much character to 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 a movie. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was, you know, again, it's something I've noticed over the years, but it, it, when, when that one guy goes flying off the side, I'm just like, when did they get on a cliff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, and like a really yeah. big one, too. It was like, whoa. Yeah, we did not. Uh, I didn't know that was there. Okay. <laughs> but it's a great sequence. It, it, I, I, have, I have nothing to say except just, just watch. I mean, if you were to turn it on, 
you know, you come across Paramount Network, and you just if you're you're in the middle of that sequence, you just watch it. It's so good. Yeah, I have nothing to say about it. And then Indy eventually gets control of the truck. He forces uh, Belloc and the other uh, uh, German army dudes off to the side of the road, and then they hide the truck in the in the the, the marketplace area, and the Nazis run away. And it looks like Indy's got the got the arc, and now they're gonna get the hell out of there. And uh, by the way, I like how they use that gag with you know parking the truck and then turning it, like decorating it like it's a shop. Yeah, very good. And then how that when you watch uh, Last Crusade, like the reverse kind of happens when when they're trying to take Brody from Sala. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that's a I, I, connected. It's been so long since I've seen Last Crusade, but I, I I know what you're talking about. Okay, yeah, Sala throws Brody into a shop, but it turns out it's actually the back of a truck, and then the Nazis take that's away. That's right. Yeah. And so I was like, "Oh, yeah. what the shit!" <laughs> we... Yeah, great sequence. But I, I, I kind of like how that the two things kind of connect each other. I, I thought that was really yeah. cool. Uh, but this is where we get introduced to Captain Katanga and his, yes. uh, his, uh, I don't know, his motley band of, <laughs> I don't know. You kind of want to call them pirates, but I guess you don't. At the same time, they're you know they're cargo mm-hmm. ships, right? I mean, I mean, I think they're supposed to be pirates. I kind of, they kind of are. They don't have a lot of other cargo, do they? That cargo holds no. really empty. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Captain Bunch Katanga. Of scallywags. Yes, and uh, but they're friends of Sala, and and so he's hooked them up. He's going to transport Indy and Marion and the Ark back to uh, friendly territory. Yeah. And this again, this is like the first time, uh, you know, in a while that the movie slows down, and you get that quiet yes. moment between Indy and Marion. And uh, again, I think it's a really great scene the way that the two the two actors communicate with each other it's just it, there's so much realness to it it doesn't feel fake or made up like they just seem to have an, uh, this natural rapport with each other and, and this, this sort of implied history with them uh, yeah. it helps lend to that familiarity for the audience to buy into yeah and like again there's great parts of it too you know when she flips the mirror and hits him in the face and you know sends him howling and then the whole thing where she's like trying to put the moves on him and then he falls asleep because he probably hasn't slept in like three days. <laughs> and, right. And he's like, you know, <laughs> going crashing through a, the Well of Souls and he's been thrown off a truck six times. You know, it's a whole thing. He's probably really tired. Not the man I knew ten years ago. It's not the years. It's the mileage. Yeah, I think he, yeah, he, he's earned it. Yeah, and again, something about that, the way that sequence plays out, them sort of not taking that moment to sort of like consummate their relationship with each other, I mm-hmm. think makes it more real in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think so too. And yeah, it, it, it just speaks to the character, to the character that, you know, he, he is just, just a real guy and he, he's bruised and battered and, you know, he's certainly down for that moment between them, but you know, he he needs his rest. He yeah. needs his eight hours. I mean, he just passes out. Like the 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 adrenaline rushes over, and now yeah. <laughs> everything hurts, and he's just tired. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it again. It's it's just kind of grounded and real. But the the tenderness between the two characters is completely authentic, and I I I'm totally in, into it and, and buy it a hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. I love it. And then uh, when the, when Indy wakes up, that's when we find out the ship has stopped, and the Nazis have showed up with a U-boat <laughs> because they're the Nazis. They have a U-boat. Yeah. Why, Why wouldn't not? They? Why wouldn't they? Now, I don't know how I want to ask this question. I mean, basically, the Nazis show up. They're looking for Jones. They're looking for Marion. They're looking for the Ark. They take the Ark. They're taking Marion, but they can't find Jones. Right. And this is where we get to like sort of one of the I don't know discrepancies. The word I want to use, but the Nazis take what they want, and they're going back to the U boat. Yeah. The pirates can't find Jones. Then, and then they see Jones, he's in the water, he's swimming out to the U-boat. Yeah, he's climbing onto the U-boat. Climbing right into that conning tower. And this is where some people get like, like oh, it doesn't make any sense. It's a U-boat, it's, it's, it's clearly diving. Uh, do you have problems with that sequence? 100%. Really? Okay. Yes. Uh, it, it, to me, so Temple of Doom gets a lot of flack for something that very illogical that happens toward the end of that movie at the end of that movie i think this is just as bad as that but more people seem to overlook it this has bothered me since i was a kid i was just like i how did he 
How did how does he get into the submarine? How do they fit the Ark into the submarine? Okay, well, okay, the submarine size issues aside, because trust me, like that's definitely a thing. Like that submarine, that particular model of of, of U boat that they have in the movie, uh, is not what you would uh, uh, typically have. I don't want to say it's, a, it's simply like a, like, a, like a plot device, but yeah, I mean you're right. Like yes, that that size submarine is not viable for the number of military forces that are on the pirate ship, let alone for storing the ark. You're you're right about that. That's very very sound. I can't argue there. I just feel like like you just buy into the fact they have a submarine and that's it. <laughs> it no, it it's absolutely fine that they have a submarine. It's just that my understanding of those submarines is once that hatch is closed, it has to be opened from the inside. So there's no way for Indy to get inside the submarine. Um it would be even if he does, it would be very hard for him to hide in the submarine. But I would be okay with that if they would show it. But they don't. And the little bit that they show of the Nazis inside the submarine, they're they're saying, my understanding is that they're saying Tashin, which means dive. So the submarine does dive. So how does Indy, how does he stay with them and, okay. and get to the, the secret Nazi island? It, okay. it, it, it doesn't make sense. Okay, let's talk. All right. According to the original screenplay, uh, I know about this, <laughs> and, and and whether you want to buy it or not, it's is is totally fine. And apparently, they filmed parts of the sequence, but not the entire thing, and they decided to move like move on with their lives. Uh, but if you were to read the Marvel comic adaptation, they illustrate <laughs> the sequence on what happens. Yes. Now, there is a certain level of disbelief that goes along with it, but yes. there is some reality that you should keep in mind as well. Uh, at this point, submarines were not quite the way that we think they are nowadays. You okay. didn't necessarily dive unless you were trying to evade enemy forces or if you're trying to sneak up on enemy forces for an attack. So in, in theory, most of the time, submarines actually didn't go underwater because uh, being under diesel power on the surface was more fuel efficient and, and, and better overall. Um, they, now, now, again, they clearly dive in this movie, but according to the script, they go to periscope depth. Right. Which is not super deep. They're just kind of like out of sight at this point. You know, it's, yeah. it's 36. You know, no one's really looking for them anyway. So they're just chilling at periscope depth. And according to the script, the screenplay, and the Marvel comic adaptation, this is when Indy uh, lashes the whip around the periscope and just kind of hangs out. <laughs> Yeah, he, he, he ties himself to it. I, I've, I've heard about this. And, you know, it, like, it's silly. Um, but, again, I, I feel like it's fine, I guess. Um, I, I just think that they should show it. Okay, okay. Um, my understanding, though, is that, that Lucas and, and Spielberg... Uh, agreed it was a bit silly and so uh like you said they'd started they at least shot some of it and then they just kind of scrapped it and were like whatever we'll just we'll just cut it out I, to me the the flaw of it is just having it be a submarine why not just have it be i don't know what other what other kind of boat the nazis would have at their disposal the first thing that comes to my mind is a destroyer i don't know why you would have a destroyer in that situation but just have it be something where indy can clearly get on board they can get the ark on board as well yeah. and indy can stow away no. to to me it's a, it's a it's a flaw it's it, it's the one thing that kind of bothers me about it but you know, it it doesn't detract too much from my enjoyment of of the movie as a whole no you i mean you're definitely not wrong like a, like, a, like a destroyer would have made more sense in, in that regard because like that would accommodate like the the large nazi force that occupies the pirate ship there's uh, ample room for the ark to be on board and and all the, right. all the all the other things that we talked about already um i think the one thing i mean if but at that point like yeah I, I you know i imagine you're not going back for reshoots and be like you know we, we're scrapping the submarine thing and we're bringing in a german destroyer or whatever like I'm, I'm assuming that probably was cost prohibitive if they probably. wanted to do it uh but if you're gonna cut a scene you know fine don't don't do the scene where, where he uses the whip and lashes to the periscope fine but also cut the scene where they're saying toshin right like just have the uba be on the surface 
Well, cut that. Or you, I, I mean, you know, another easy solution would have been, um, you know, we, we see Indy climb onto the submarine. Right. So all we have to do is, like, leave one Nazi soldier on the conning tower and have Indy, like, take that guy out, knock him off, and then go into the submarine and close the hatch and have him hide somewhere. I, my understanding is, like, a summer, like that would be a very hard place to hide and stow away. But I could go with that. And I feel like that is something that would have been... Uh, they they would have been able to do that with with the budget. Like yeah. I feel like they could have gone back and reshot that with just a few shots. No, I'm I'm not going to argue with that either. That would have been perfectly accept- acceptable as well too. I I, th- I think they ultimately decided, and like this may have been a decision that was made after filming, like in post production as they were cutting the movie yeah. together. Uh, yeah. And I think at this point, you know, these made decisions like you know what, if the if the audience is along for the ride at this point, they're along for the ride, and and you know we'll just kind of fudge this and and hope that. It's not a big thing, and it. I think to most people, it's probably not a big thing, honestly. Yeah, I, I like I said, I, I, you know, I think they were more or less right about that, you know, because e- even though it it takes me out of it, I still, you know, I I immensely enjoy the movie. I just see it as like, eh, I wish they had done something different there, but this is still great. Yeah, yeah, a hundred. I. Agree. Like I said, you can if you want to like fixate on that scene, and 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 all that stuff, you, you can. But like, why bother? Like, it's such a just go on the ride with the movie. You're you're in, you're invested at this point. Just have fun. It, it you know, I, like do I do? I mean, do do people do like like breakdowns on the Fast and the Furious movies about how like the laws of physics are broken in every single one of them? I mean, no, they don't. Dude, dude don't even bring up the Fast and Furious <laughs> to me. Those movies are garbage. <laughs> I know someone listening to this podcast who is going to fight you on that. Like they, you can't even compare the two. No, I listen. You're not wrong. Uh, one thing, <laughs> I, one thing I did want to mention too. Uh, back, back on Katanga's boat with with the arc in in the storage, the sequence where we see like the Nazi symbol and all the branding on the box burning away. Yeah. What a cool touch. Awesome. Like what a what a great way to kind of kind of like evoke a little like religious mythology into into your movie i mean about a religious artifact no less but making it it be something that's that's proactive and and showing that it's it's capable of doing things in in a sense i don't know if that's the right word i want to use but that there is a a power that emanates from it and again you you kind of call back to the ten commandments and and worshiping of false idols like the like the like the uh, like the swastika and stuff like that well, yeah, I mean, just that and the fact that, you know, this is this is a Hebrew relic and it's being encased in something stamped with something that is completely antithetical to to that religion, you know, and almost like it's it the the arc itself is, is striking out against this this thing that is that is hateful towards it. Yeah. Well, I, I also wondered if it, if it would just be that way towards any any sort of symbol of, of, of like vice, false I, uh, vice I, idolatry. Yeah, maybe. I, yeah. I, I, but I mean, I mean, your 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 point is well taken. Like that that's a, a great take on it too. I just I, I, I just love that like the the arc goes from being a thing to being the thing. You know what I mean? Like it's it's like no no no. This arc is is all the stories we've been, we we have been are being told in this movie are like legit like this thing has got power inside of it like we're gonna see right. something happen yeah and it's a cool you know it's cool foreshadowing of, of, of what happens yeah yep 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 all right so now we can get we can get to the secret nazi uh base uh, you know somewhere around what looked like crete on the map but uh you know what do i know yeah um how's that final sequence play out to you by the way uh, I, I should point out at this point in the movie uh indiana jones loses the fedora it's gone Yes, he does, yeah. No fedora from here on out. Yeah. You know, I don't know if they thought that through <laughs> or what. I, I mean, was he supposed to wear it as he's trying to disguise himself in the, the Nazi base? No, I mean, it's, but it's just funny to think about, uh, you know, the 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 next installments of, of indie series and, and how, like, the hat's so important to him. Like, the extra efforts he makes to retrieve the hat in, in scenarios in Temple of Doom, in Last Crusade, yeah. in other things. Uh, but in the, in this one, the the first one, you know, they don't know if there's gonna be another one, so like they're probably not that worried about it. But yeah. it, but it is just funny to know, like fedora gone, jacket gone. Like he doesn't he doesn't go back into his 
quote unquote, you know, uh, uh, uniform for the for the rest of the mm-hmm. flick. Like he's disguised as a German soldier, and that's how it is the rest of the movie. No fedora, nothing. Like very different from Indy in other movies. Yeah, you know, it's it's the uh, it's the rolling up of the sleeves, so to speak. Yeah, but I I enjoy the sequence. I enjoy again. I enjoy the 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 dialogue, the interplay between Jones and and Belloc when they're when they're going back and forth. When Jones has the rocket launcher and he's gonna yeah. blow up the ark, but he can't blow up the ark because he, he he wants to see too. He wants to know. He wants to understand. Um, yeah. And then you find out uh, you don't fuck with the word of God, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Uh, of the <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of good lines in the build to this too. Uh, I I won't I won't uh, uh horrify our audience with, with my rendition of them. Okay. Uh, but there's so much good stuff. Like I lo- and I love how like the German officers are uncomfortable uh, doing a quote unquote Jewish ritual. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much good stuff in the in these final sequences that uh. And you're just like, oh, I can't wait for these fuckers to have their faces melted. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens, my friend. But Indy realizes you don't look at the face of God. Right. And that's what these Nazis have decided to do. And uh, it gets them in the end, my friend. It gets them in the end. What did you think of that whole sequence? How's that, how's that play for you? Like, like, I know when we were kids, I think we were a little confused at first. But eventually we figured it out. Like, like oh, it's the power of God. You, you know, it's not for, for man's eye, mortal eyes to see. Well, I think it's that, and it's also um, when the power, the kind of lightning that that first comes out of the uh, out of the arc, it takes out all of the lights and uh, and like the the, the generator. Yeah. I think that's operating yeah. the lights. Um, so I think that's that's kind of like another clue for Indy and for the audience as well uh, that that this is not something that is uh, meant to be seen. Um, and I, but I, I think the sequence is, is great. I love the, um, I love the special effects of the spirits that, that come out of the arc and, uh, you know, totes face melting is seared into my brain. <laughs> Again, another, I love another it. yeah, just another moment from, of a film full of moments like that where you're like you can't unsee what you just saw <laughs> where, yeah i mean th- th- that like defined that <laughs> face melting for a really long time <laughs> yeah and 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 belloc's head straight up explodes <laughs> it just straight up explodes it's awesome <laughs> yeah i mean it, you know him kind of becoming like this vessel that's like shooting the lightning beams out of his eyes and stuff like that i mean it's it's a really wild great sequence uh it sort of calls back to what indy says uh, in 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 you know before he before he leaves uh, his home and he's talking to Brody about how he doesn't believe in superstitious mumbo jumbo and then right. that's exactly what's what's happening to him right here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it, it it's a great callback again. Like we said before, the, the script is tight, it's lean. It the things that sets up it at the beginning come into play at the end or in the middle, depending on you know on on where they want to connect those dots. Uh, but it but it's all right there. I mean, it's it's one of the best screenplays I think is ever written. You know, you you can mm-hmm. you you can critique the the submarine thing. I I understand. I mean, and yeah. They 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 did write a sequence in to explain it. They just yeah, they, they did. Yeah. You know, so I mean, you know, whatever. I I this is why Kasdan is Lawrence Kasdan. I mean, this and and Empire and you know all the things. Kasdan, he's a guy. Wyatt Earp. We're not gonna talk about Wyatt Earp, but if you want to talk, <laughs> if you want to talk about Silverado, we can talk about Silverado all day long because I love that I've, fucking movie. I've not seen Silverado. What? Yeah, to this day, I've not gotten around to checking out Silverado. Silverado Maybe. is a fucking gem. <laughs> I know you love it. Kevin so. Klein, Kevin Costner, Danny Glover. Come on, so good. It's too many, too many Kevin's. <laughs> That's what I say in life. <laughs> all right, all right, whatever. <laughs> uh, and then, okay, so basically, like Indian Marion, last people standing. All the Nazis are dead. They're gone. Their their bodies and spirits are all sucked up and blown back into the ark. The whole thing. Well, let me ask you about that. Yeah. The, well, I mean, I, all of the Nazis that were there at the opening of the ark, you know, I don't, I don't feel like that's the entire island's worth of Nazis. No, so, probably not. No. So, do you think those spirits went around and 
melted the faces of every other Nazi on the island. Like I, like I, I would have liked to have seen, you know, the uh, like if that's the case, I would like to have seen a little bit of that because it does the the way it is. It, it does leave the question in your mind of like, well, how do like still there's other Nazis, so how do how do Indian Marion get off the island with the Ark? That is a valid question. Well, apparently, my my understanding is is that uh, at least in the original screenplay, they there was a little action sequence after that, and they they got out through a uh, a crazy mine car chase. What? Yeah, I I read that. I don't know a hundred percent if it's true, but apparently that was something that was at least in one of the iterations of 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 the screenplay. Huh, that's interesting. I mean, I've 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 read theories. I don't know if I've read anything that was like concrete. You know, that the one of the theories I read that was that like he got back to the base and radio for Katanga to come and get him. But uh, okay, I, yeah, you know, that makes again, sense. I have no idea. We, you know, we just we just assume they get away. I mean. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean but I mean to your point like no, I don't think it killed every Nazi on the island. I think it killed the ones that, you know, had the audacity to look at the power of God. Right. Or the face of God or however you want to like term you know, term it term it, I suppose. Yeah. So yeah, I'm assuming there's still Nazis in that base. <laughs> or you know, I guess they they you know, perhaps they just stole a, a German boat and they they went to, you know, if they, yeah. if, if it was Crete like it looked like on the map, maybe they just went up to like Greece or somewhere and was like, "Hey, let's call, let's call for help." Yeah, yeah. But regardless of how they actually did it, next week when we catch up with our heroes, some time has passed. They are in Washington, D.C. They're trying to figure out, you know, the Ark has been turned over to the government. We got, we find that it's being taken care of by top men, Mark. Top men. Yep. An old man in a warehouse. And a giant warehouse full of boxes. Yeah. I really like that. Not ending. Area 51. Well. <laughs> well. <laughs> well. <laughs> hmm. What do you think of the ending of the movie? I mean, it's classic. I love, um, you know, I, I love kind of the the realization that, you know, Indy and, and, and Marcus have that, you know, the U.S. military is going to do with this thing what they will. It was never going to go into a museum. Uh, their frustration with that, as Indy says, bureaucratic fools. Yeah. Uh, we get a nice little moment between Indy and Marion where they're going to, you know, they're going to have a drink. And so we kind of, you know, we can imagine what happens from there between those two characters. And, and yeah, and then we get the, um, you know, we get the old man wheeling the, the crate carrying the Ark into the, the massive warehouse. And yeah, it, I think it's a, a perfect ending. It's, yeah, it's really great. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I still enjoy it to this day. I uh, I always speculate. It's like, ooh, what else? Other cool shit they got in that warehouse, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to talk about what maybe was in there in the uh, this alleged fourth Indiana Jones movie that we won't talk about. No. no, no. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's Indiana Jones. In the, uh, it, really, that's just uh, that's Raiders of the Lost Ark. I know it's been kind of rebranded as Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, but uh, that is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yep. Right here on his 40th freaking anniversary, which I still can't believe. It still blows my mind that it's 40 years since this came out. Yeah, we, it's crazy. We are, uh, we are, and not that we didn't know this already, but we're old, Mark. We're really, really old. I don't think of myself that way, but okay. <laughs> I don't either, but then I see things like this, and I'm like, oh, maybe I am. Just a number. <laughs> I, I, well, I'll say it again. This is the movie I watch constantly. I love this movie. It, it is such a part of me. My childhood, my adolescence, my adulthood. Uh, I love it to death. I think, it, uh, to me, it's one of the movies I consider basically perfect. And, and again, like I understand where you could nit pick the nits. I get it. But but you know, just like just like Alien, just like Die Hard, like this is one of those movies. Like I am so happy when I watch this movie. Uh, I uh, to me, it, it's is just mwah, perfect. Yeah. So much fun. Agreed. Any <laughs> any closing thoughts? Oh, not really. I mean, I I think we kind of we kind of covered it all. I mean, you know, with uh, 
with the exception of kind of the the few, as you like to say, nits that I picked, I, I think it is it is very close to a perfect movie. Yeah, yeah, fair. Hey, that's fair. And as we sort of tease, I, I did want to mention or, or talk to you a little, just a little bit about uh, some of the so, some of the movies that are uh, that have, have tried to, uh, you know, some were outright outright rip offs. Uh, but some movies were, you know, in, in games and things that were very much inspired by. What were some of your favorite movies that are that are sort of uh, Indiana Jones esque? You know, we, we you, you talked about National Treasure, and we got Tomb Raiders, obviously the games and the movies, and Uncharted, and I think there's even like a Chuck Norris movie that was kind of Indiana Jones esque, with like Chuck and really? Louis Goss- I think it was Chuck Norris and Louis Gossett Jr. Uh, it was like Firewalker or some shit. You remember that one? I, that sounds familiar, but I I haven't seen it. I'm not that familiar with uh, Chuck Norris's body of work. Well, and um, then uh, then they they brought back they tried to bring back those Alan Quartermain uh, movies. And I, th- I, th- I want to say it was, yeah. like, it was like Richard Chamberlain or something, right? Yes, it was Richard Chamberlain, and uh, they were pretty bad. They were pretty bad. Um, yeah. But, but, but uh, what are what are some of your favorites of the of the the Indiana Jones inspired or you know. Hopefully, not ripping off of. <laughs> well, honestly, I I don't I don't really know if I have any. Like, I mean, I I do think the National Treasure films are are fun, um, you know. But they're you know they certainly aren't like favorites of mine. But you know they're they're an okay watch. Um, but other than that, I. I struggled to think of anything. I, I didn't see the last Tomb Raider film. I was never a fan of the games. The The first two movies with Angelina Jolie are, are pretty laughable. Um, you know, I, I think I, I what I said earlier kind of stands, which is, you know, I just, I just think of the Goonies kind of treasure hunting, and that's uh, <laughs> that's about it. Yeah, that's compl- I think that's completely fair. And again, Spielberg's hands are all over the Goonies, and I love that movie too. So there's nothing yeah. wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, much like you, I, I didn't care for the first two Tomb Raider movies with, with Angelina. I liked the I liked the first couple games. I I did lose track of them eventually. Um, yeah. Uh, but then they kind of rebooted the series on on Xbox and stuff like that. So I I do like those versions of the game. They've been okay. a lot of fun. I did like the uh, I think it was a uh, what, what was the actor's name uh, Alicia Vikander Vikander? Vikander 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 yeah she's good yeah yeah I thought she was I did, I did like her Tomb Raider movie uh, okay I don't know if they're gonna do more with it I, though it it's not very Indiana Jones ish I'm not gonna lie it's it's it, but it's just a kind of a good action movie I mean it just looked like Tomb Raider Begins <laughs> yeah kind of sort of. Uh, I, I, you know, I do sort of enjoy the first National Treasure movie. I'm not going to lie. The second one's not great, but. It's not great, but it's got some enjoyable right. aspects I, I do, it. I do like the puzzling out of things and, and you know, it's, it's yeah. they're interesting enough. They're, they're, they're sort of like disposable entertainment, you know? Like, yeah. They're fine. Uh, yeah. I did, I did like the Uncharted video games. I am hopeful that the movies will be good, but we'll see. Um, and yeah, those, those Alan Quartermans were terrible. And, uh, oh wait a minute! Aren't you a fan of um, you're a fan of, like Dan Brown, right? Oh, I don't know. I, yeah, I am. I mean, and, and I say that knowing full well that like he's not a great like art, you know. It's not literature. Author. It's not great literature yeah. that I'm reading when I read a Dan Brown novel. I don't like yeah, but I mean, I guess that's kind of similar in that you know you have the the character kind of puzzling out things. I didn't like. I thought Da Vinci Code was an okay movie. Uh, I didn't. I didn't like the second one though. Um, no, I like those fine. I don't know if I can consider them Indiana Jones just just because I don't they, uh, like uh, uh, the the character Langdon is not uh, like action oriented enough. Like he's really good at, sure. at solving puzzles. Uh, but okay. he's, he's not. Yeah. He's also not going to like have a bullwhip on his side any, anytime soon. Mm, well, maybe maybe Dan Brown will hear your thoughts and, <laughs> and add that. No, I I like those in a sense uh, for sure, but I, I don't consider them the same vein. I guess I guess is where I'm going with that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's I. Those are like the the obvious influences. I think as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's that's all I've got. Yeah, but it, 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 I think at a certain point people realize like, everyone knows we're ripping off Indiana Jones. <laughs> so Right. Um, and I know, you know, we have talked about it on the podcast. We, we've been doing the, the casting updates and any news that comes out about Indiana Jones 5. Uh, Mark, where do you land on Indiana Jones 5? Are you yay or nay 
on Indiana Jones 5. Stop. Please stop. <laughs> Please. It was it was too much. It was too much when you did 4. Like Harrison Ford is what? 80 years old? What do you No. Just no. Just stop. It reminds me of that uh, that that joke on the Simpsons. Remember they did like the they had like the commercial for Star Trek 9 or whatever and it's like yes. so very very tired. Yes. <laughs> Like I like I felt that way when I saw part four. Like I, I I saw an old man punching like thirty year olds and knocking them like ten feet back, and I was just like, this is not this is not good. So you know, like I I can only imagine what like what a mess this is going to be. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 not for it. No, I listen. I, I'm not. I don't necessarily disagree with you on that. I, I'm. I'm just. I, I guess I just cling to the hope that James Mangold and uh, the the people he's assembled around him can 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 pull something off to sort of redeem the the series after the last entry, which uh, we we won't talk about much. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look, you know, look. There, there's always hope, and and yeah, you know, maybe maybe they'll they will make a good movie. You know. It, my understanding is that, you know, he's Indy will be more of the kind of father Sean Connery character. Like, oh, you know, okay, all right. So yeah, we'll 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 see what they do. Yeah. Well, I just don't have much, if any, if it, it, much and certainly not high hopes. Well and uh, I am a sucker for Baz Mickelson, so uh yeah, I'll watch it just for him. Oh, I did not hear he was in it. He was oh, casting. yeah. We don't know when Ro- Roll. Right. I mean, the assumption is since it's an American movie, he'll probably be the bad guy. But, <laughs> but you know, you never know. <laughs> yeah. I would like it if he was Indy's ally. But we'll see if they decide to, like, uh, you know, up that apple cart. Yeah. Yeah. Did, uh, have, they, have they said anything plot-wise? Is it no, gonna be... nothing, nothing. We don't know, you know, what kind of adventure he's going on, what kind of artifacts he's looking for. We don't know anything. We don't know. The, right. We don't even know the time period. We don't even know like what the what the setting's going to be. Yeah, because it seems like anytime they, uh, y- y- for, you know, I love Temple of Doom, but I know kind of critically, it's I don't want to say maligned, but it's more heavily criticized than the other two of the first three. And it seemed like after they made that one, they kind of went back to the well on well, let's just have them fight some more Nazis. So. After the the uh, you know the the big swing and a miss that was Indy Four, are they just going to go back to the well and have him fighting Nazis? I don't know how you can. I mean, Harrison Ford is like you said, he's eighty years old for God's sakes. Yeah. We'll yeah, see. <laughs> I feel like you have to advance the storyline and put it like in, I think the last one was in the fifties. I think you got to put it in the sixties, right? I uh, look. I would think so, but you know. So who's he we'll fighting see. in the sixties? A bunch of like angry hippies. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> I, I might be, I might be able to get behind that movie. Militant hippies, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> they're a contradiction, folks, but they're menacing. <laughs> That's all that matters. Oh man. Well, hey, who knows? We'll, we'll talk about that soon. Hopefully, I'll have you come back on and we can talk about Temple of Doom because I love Temple of Doom. I am a big, big fan of Temple of Doom. And, I am a massive fan of Temple. Of yeah, Doom. I, I, you know, I don't. Again, I'm not going to say it, it, it is not better than Raiders of the Lost Ark, but. Much like you said, it is undeservedly maligned uh, because I think Temple of Doom is fucking excellent. <laughs> it's such a good time, and it's dark, and it's awesome. And we'll talk about that because I have a whole thing already about you know, when the movie was filmed and the, and the whole thing with cults, and, and I got a whole thing. Don't worry. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I'll be interested in hearing that. And um, you know what? I, I think – I'm just going to say might – but I think it might be better than Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ooh, big talk. Yeah, big talk. I said it. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, Mol- <laughs> Molaram is pretty badass. I'm not gonna lie. Molaram is awesome, <laughs> and the the weird the the weird like rumors around that guy make it even more interesting. Uh, you know, <laughs> yes, but since the advent of the internet, I've been able to debunk most of those rumors. <laughs> so damn it. <laughs> I, know, I know. I was a, I was a big fan of that the, those rumors too, but. Uh, I was I I you know just going on IMDb and you're like oh no he's just a guy. <laughs> Damn. I know the internet ruins everything. I I get it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mark, let's get the heck out of here. We've gone two hours already, but I think we've killed it. <laughs> I hope so. And hopefully in the good way, not not, not like people are are dead because they're tired of listening to us. Right, but in the. <laughs> 
the way Indiana Jones kills people. <laughs> yes, maliciously <laughs> and in the name of, of in the name of of the good guys. That's right. <laughs> that belongs in a museum, Mark. So do you. So do you. There it is. Let's get out of here. <laughs> uh, thanks, man. I'll talk to you later. See ya. Bye. Right back to God. All your life has been spent in pursuit of archaeological relics. Inside the ark are treasures beyond your wildest aspirations. You want to see it open as well as I. Indiana, we are simply passing through history. This, this is history. And there you have it, Buckethead Nation, a, an extremely long conversation, but I feel like a pretty darn entertaining one about Raiders of the Lost Ark, how it comes together as one of my favorite films of all time, not named Star Wars, and <laughs> how it just kicks off an amazing adventure series and, and all the good things. I, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Uh, like I said, it, it's it's revisiting conversation from a few years back, but I think it's still... Uh, holds up. It's still solid, and I think it's still pretty darn entertaining. So uh, thank you for indulging me on that this week. Next week's episode is an all-new conversation recorded especially for 2023. So I hope you'll stick around for that because Raider, or excuse me, Temple of Doom, I think it's a vastly underrated film, and it's it's important to me that we talk about why it's so vastly underrated and why it's maybe better than some people think it is. Uh, so I hope you'll join us next week for that, and then we will get back uh, to the regular our regularly scheduled program of, of covering the final four episodes for season five of Star Wars, The Clone Wars. Uh, and then, it, then I would imagine it's, it's Star Wars for the rest of the way out for the rest of forever. And because, again, like I said, this is probably the last Indiana Jones movie coming out. You know, maybe I'll make mention of my opinion after I see the flick. Ah, we, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Again, you kind of know me. If, if I don't think that highly of it, I may not talk about it at all. But we'll see. We'll see what's up. So I thank you for indulging me on this. I really appreciate you guys hanging out, listening to the show. Hit me up. Let me know what you think. Are, are you mad that we interrupted the podcast? Are you are you kind of excited for a little diversion? Are, are, are you fired up for some Indiana Jones? Let me know. Find me on social media. We're at Mando underscore Vision on Twitter and Instagram. Email the show, MandoVisionTom at gmail.com. Make sure to like, subscribe, follow, and share this show with all the Mandalorians in your covert. Remember, I am Tom, Nargai Tom. This is the MandoVision podcast. Normally, we are a small independent Star Wars podcast, except for today and next week when we'll be a small independent Indiana Jones podcast. <laughs> but but we thank you for your support, Buckethead Nation. You continue to be the best listeners in the world. And our numbers continue to grow and thrive. And it's because of the awesome people like you who share the show, who tell their friends about it, and do all the good things. Uh, remember to hit us up with five-star reviews on whatever platform you listen to because they really do help us stand out and not get lost in the shuffle because I don't know if you're aware – there are 75 bajillion podcasts out there. So all the help we can get, uh, really, really appreciate it. You are all the best. Thank you, members of Buckethead Nation. Keep it going. Let's get out of here. This has been a long one already. We'll be back next week with Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and I cannot wait for you to hear that one. It's a great, great, lively conversation. So remember, this podcast can only end one way. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. When did they find the map room? Three days ago. They have not one brain among them. Except one. He's very clever. He's a French archaeologist. What's his name? Well, we call him Baloche. 